since 1992. But last year's close call left them hungry for October baseball. Their future looks bright, but they feel the future is now. Tonight, two teams at different stages of their development sharing that one ageless dream. You're looking at the Network Associates Coliseum on the eastern shore of the San Francisco Bay, where tonight, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball gives you the Baltimore Orioles and the Oakland Athletics. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller. Welcome to Sunday Night Baseball. We've got a beautiful night, a windy night for a ball game here in Oakland. The Orioles are going for a sweep. The Athletics, the young, powerful Athletics, they've been struggling. They need a win. Now, for the Orioles, off to a hot start. My partner, Joe Morgan, wanted to find out what was going on with them, so he met up with future Hall of Famer Cal Ripken before the game. Well, you chased Lou Gehrig, you caught him. You chased 3,000 hits, you've accomplished that. You've chased 400 home runs, you've accomplished that. Now, how does it feel that you're really not chasing anything for the first time in your life, at least in the last few years? Well, I never set out to, to do all those things. I never set out to chase anyone, but it seems like at certain moments, pressure and, and, and the way that we like to compare players from past to, to present time, that added a little bit of distraction, a little bit of pressure. Uh, the 3,000 hit thing, uh, I thought it was going to be a little easier than, than, than it turned out to be. Uh, but trying to get a hit and trying to put extra pressure on yourself to have a good at bat, um, I'm glad that's all over. Uh, I, I feel now that I can get relaxed in the batter's box and I can say, okay, just have a good at bat, knowing they're going to be future at bat. So I feel very good right now, very relaxed. Well, John, what I think you'll see from Cal in the future is he's going to be a guy that will take a day off after a night game. He's going to relax a little bit more. I think you'll see him grow old gracefully and have a great season as well. All right. Now, for the Oakland Athletics, trying to avoid being swept here tonight, this is a ball club with a lot of power in that lineup. Guys like Jason Giambi is off to a great start. John Jaha was on the All-Star team. Ben Grieve, Matt Stairs, they have a loaded lineup. Yeah, John, but they're not hitting on all cylinders as they have in the past. What their A's have built on is power and pitch. Pitching has struggled a little bit, and their power hitters have struggled. They've been leaving a lot of runners on base. You have guys like Matt Stairs, who I think, I love to watch him hit. I think he's the key to this offense. Jason Giambi always hits. So Matt Stairs is the guy that I think they need to get started today. All right. Now with us on our Sunday night crew, Alvaro Martin. Let's go to Alvaro. Thanks, John. The Oakland A's have one of the loosest clubhouses in the majors, and for many good reasons. This team hasn't really had high expectations up until this year. There are no superstars in this team as of yet, and the team is made up of a core of players that came up together in the minors. Now, the veterans like Jason Giambi, Matt Stairs, and Omar Olivares keep the team loose with one-liners to make sure they make, th make it through the ups and downs of a season. One final note. When they're on the road, the veterans treat the players to a night out. And as you can imagine, attendance is very high. Gentlemen. All right, Alvaro. It is. The Athletics of Oakland, the Orioles of Baltimore, Sunday Night Baseball from the Coliseum. Mark Mulder will have to face the veterans like Albert Bell, Cal Ripken, and uh, the entire Baltimore crew, Jason Johnson up against the Oakland Sluggers. There's the city of Oakland, and there is the Network Associates Coliseum, home of the Athletics. And also, in another season, the... Oakland Raiders, and here is the new manager of the Baltimore Orioles, Mike Hargrove, who had his clear with Indians with five consecutive division titles, a couple of trips to the World Series, and now Hargrove has uh, led the Orioles to an 11-5 start here in the 2000 season. Here's the Pepsi Orioles batting order. Rich Amaral leads off in center field. Brady Anderson gets the night off. Mike Bordick, he leads the league in RBIs. He has been something else. B.J. Surhoff in left. Albert Bell hitting cleanup in right. Jeff Conine at first. Cal Ripken, fresh off his 3,000th hit at third base. Will Clark, the DH. Charles Johnson, the catcher. And Jesse Garcia in place of Delano DeShields at second base. And on the mound for the Athletics, a young, exciting left-hander, Mark Mulder. Mulder, only 22 years of age. And that is called a strike. John Mark Mulder is a guy that they think highly of. He was the number two player selected in the draft. In 1998, Pat Bur Burrell of the Phillies went number one. This guy has a good fastball, good curveball. He's really been working on the slider, and he also throws a changeup. 
and they say he really has a lot of poise out there on the mound. They were really impressed last week when he started his first game against Cleveland and how he was able to come inside on some of the right-handed hitters to keep them honest. And that's a foul ball by Amaral. One ball and two strikes. Mulder out of Michigan State University. He was the MVP there both in 1997 and 98. He was a third-team All-American as a junior when he set a school record for strikeouts. There's that inside pitch you're talking about. Strike three call. And that's what he does so well. He keeps the right-handers honest, and then he'll run the ball away. And let's take a look at the defense behind Mark. And there you see the defense. Tejada just signed a new three-year contract. Actually, a four-year contract, so he'll be around for a while. And there you see... He's made a couple of nice plays this series. Has a lot of range, and he has some pop in his bat. Good player. He's an exciting player as we return to live action. Now Mulder to Mike Bordick, and that is ball one. Now, Mike Bordick used to be with the Oakland Athletics, and he never hit like this when he played here. Called strike. One ball, one strike. To Mike Bordick, leading the league in RBIs, which is phenomenal. Hitting in the number two spot today, although he's most of the time hit in the uh, lower part of the batting order. That's what's amazing, John. He's leading the league, and he usually hits ninth in this lineup for the Orioles. Well, he's had some RBI chances hitting ninth because Will Clark has been hitting a couple of spots ahead of him, and Will Clark has had a 554 on base average. And so he's been driving in Will Clark a lot. Three and one the count to Mike Bordick. Here's How far have we come when Will Clark is, Clark is setting the stage for Mike Bordick? <laughs> Mind, I just got to get on base for Bordick. <laughs> That's what he will. He will told me that. He said, I'm just getting on base for these hot hitters behind me. Battling a tough son, Matt Stairs, near the warning track. Hot number two. And we're pleased to see that Ramon Hernandez, the very exciting young catcher of the athletics, is wearing mask cam tonight to bring you right into the batter's box home plate area. There's B.J. Surhoff. He was an American League All-Star last year. 353 average. One homer, eight batted in. The Orioles, as a team, are hitting 309. So it's not just boarding. Who's off to a hot start. There's the view from Matt's camp. Strike on the outside. And you contrast that with the A's, John. They're hitting 250. I mean, big difference in the batters batters on these two ball clubs right now. Who's hot and who's not? And the Orioles are averaging nearly seven runs per game. Just a little off the outside there. One ball and one strike. Getting our first look at Mark Mulder. He was the second player drafted in the June of 98 free agent draft. Well, they got Surhoff chasing his pitch that time, and the unassisted put out for Jason Giambi. The Orioles go quietly. The Athletics are coming up. The ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. The Orioles nothing. The Athletics coming up now against a, a young Orioles pitcher, although with more big league experience than the Athletics' Mark Mulder. And there's Art Howe in his fifth year as the Athletics manager. Trying to take this ball club that was very inexperienced and going nowhere when he arrived and to mold all of this young talent into a perennial contender. Here's the Pepsi Oakland batting order. It'll be Rich Becker, center field, Miguel Tejada at shortstop. Jason Giambi, the very powerful off to a great start at first base. John Jaha, an all-star last year, but struggling this year. He's the DH. Matt Stairs in right field. Ben Grieve is in left field. By the way, Stairs overall struggling early this year, but he's gotten it together here lately. Grieve, then Ramon Hernandez, the catcher. Eric uh, Chavez at third base, and Frankie Menachino at second base in place of the injured Randy Villardi. And on the mound for the Orioles, the young right-hander, Jason Johnson. And John Johnson has a good fastball. He will throw it up. He's been trying to work on a sinker, but his riding fastball is his best fastball. There's a big breaking curveball, and he's really been working on his changeup this spring to improve it. They just called him back up to give him this start. His uh, first start of the big leagues this year. And that is a ball inside. Rich Becker, veteran. At one time, he was a switch hitter in his days with the Minnesota Twins. The team began his career, but then 
was having so little success as a right-hander, he just gave it up. Strictly a left-handed batter. Fastball too low. Becker hitting 268. And like many of the A's hitters, he is very, very patient up there. He gets a lot of walks. He's got a 423 on base average. Fastball is a strike. Two and one. That's sort of the formula for the Oakland Athletics. Be patient, get a lot of walks, get people on base, and then have a lot of power to drive all those guys in. Right. Two and one. Right center field battling the sun out there. Albert Bell not coming over from center field and taking charge. Rich Amaral, he had a little better angle on it. And that is out number one. And that's the way you're supposed to work it. Albert was going to make the catch, but the center fielder knew he could get there, so he took the play. And let's take a look at the defense. Charles Johnson behind the plays one gold gloves in both leagues. And he's one of the better throwers in, in baseball. And you have Cal Ripken Jr. third. Pretty good defense, Bordy. Pretty good glove, man. It's shortstop. Now Miguel Tejada. Ripken knocks it down. And not in time. Tejada's got great speed. And he is aboard. Well, Tejada's a free swinger. They say one of these days when he learns to be more patient at the plate, he's going to be as good as the other great shortstops in his league. Ripken actually started to his left. He looked like he was full. That means the pitch was outside, and it was he was leaning that way, and Tejada reached out and pulled it. When you see a guy move to his left, that's because the ball is away. See, watch. See, right there, he starts to his left, and the ball's back to his right. That means Tejada reached out and jerked the ball down the line rather than just hitting it where it was pitched. Now the powerful Jason Giambi. Strike with a fastball. By the way, that'll be scored as an error on Ripken. Jason Giambi just one RBI behind Mike Bordick. Got the two top RBI men in the American League, at least they were at the start of the day in this game. Giambi, unlike Bordick, those a guy you would expect to be among the leaders. Big and strong. And that's outside for a ball. One plus ball, he, one strike. Plus he hits in an RBI spot, third slot. We've seen Bordick, who was here with the A's, now turn into an RBI man after he left. We saw Scott Brocious do the same thing over at New York, hitting at the bottom of the order, driving in a lot of runs since they've left the A's. I mean, Giambi, I mean, he just looks like a guy driving a lot of runs. And if, if we were making a movie and we wanted a guy who played the big third place hitter who hit homers and drove in runs, if Giambi walked in, we'd say, we have our man. <laughs> right? He's tight cat. He's big. He's strong. Last year, he ended up with 33 homers and 123 runs batted in. And he hit 315. And he walked 105 times. Now, with numbers like that, Joe, I'm sure a lot of our viewers may be saying, wow, I didn't know that. I mean, because Jeremy's not a guy who's got the big name around the country playing out here in Oakland. Those are pretty impressive numbers. The kid, his favorite, was Mickey Mantle. Now Ripken, just behind the bag in fair territory. And Giambi is retired. He hurt his knee when the Athletics were in Boston a little over a week ago. He sat out a few games and has been de-aging. But tonight, back in there at first base, Giambi is retired. First, and here is John Jaha. Now, this is another guy who had a very big year for the Athletics last year. Jaha, formerly with the Milwaukee Brewers, a lot of injury problems, but last year his career was resurrected. The pitch out, Tejada not running. Jaha had 35 homers at 111 runs batted in. And he's off to a very slow start. You see their 143 average, but they figure he can't get out of his slump on the bench, though they're playing him. They say, we're going to let him get some at-bats and see if he can get on, get hot here. They're particularly poor against right-handed pitching. That's foul. It's late on that fastball. And that's pretty good fastball, 93 miles an hour from Jason Johnson. That's the riding fastball we talked about. He throws it up in the strike zone, and he's been working on developing a sinker to go along with that high fastball. 
Chaha is 0 for 20 this year against right-handed pitching. In his 28 overall at bats, he has struck out 16 times. On the inside corner. One ball and two strikes. Jaha has not yet homered and has only one RBI. And he's had some injury problems that he's been dealing with this year. And last year as well. He was injured a lot last year, but he still put up those big numbers, which was amazing because of all the injuries he had last year. Tejada at first, no score in the game. And the curveball going outside. Two and two. Jaha did not exactly struggle against right-handed pitching last year. He had 24 of his 35 home runs against right-handers and only 328 at-bats against them. Into the hands, foul back to the screen. When you watch Jaha, you can see he's late on the fastball and early on the breaking ball. That's what happens to a player when his timing is off. And what that caused you to do is start to your swing a little early and now you're vulnerable to the breaking ball. If you have to worry about the fastball inside, you become very vulnerable to a breaking ball away, but it looks like they're going to pitch him inside again. Uh, didn't get it quite far enough in there. Down the right field line and foul. That might have been helped on its way into foul ground by the wind a little bit, which is swirling around inside here. And not a good pitch there by Jason Johnson. They wanted the ball inside where they've been having some success with Jaha. But watch, he gets this ball out over the plate. See, Johnson set up inside. Look where he reaches out over the plate for the ball. And he's, last year when Jaha was swinging the bat so well, if you make a mistake like that, he'd hit it out of the ballpark. But because his timing is off a little bit now, he fouls it off instead of driving it. So that, that was the pitch they hit right yep. there. Two and two the count. Now they go to that slider in the dirt. And the count is full, three and two. The ball knocked down by Charles Johnson. I don't know if anybody knocks balls like that down better than Charles Johnson. It's the ball in front of him. Well, remember his story? He told us about how his father used to stand him in front of him and just throw the ball and bounce it in front of him to make him learn to block the pitch, pitches like that. There goes Tejada. And the walk to Jaha. Johnson loses it. Two men on. Two men out. And now Matt Stairs with the, the big swing and the big power. And although he was off to a painfully slow start the first couple of weeks of this season, earlier this week, he homered in three consecutive games. Well, he said he was opening up. He was stepping open with his front side. And the hitting instructor, Thad Bosley, got him to step more towards second base. And all of a sudden, he started hitting home runs. Well, last year, he hit 38 home runs with 102 RBIs. Trent's curveball is just a bit high. There's Thad Bosley, the hitting instructor for the Oakland A's. He's been trying to get most of the hitters to aim everything back to the big part of the ballpark. And he figures they're still jerk the ball when it's inside. The, the A's have hit a lot of home runs in the past, but they've also struck out a lot. And that changeout that he was working on this spring that you talked about, Joe. One that was ball, a, one strike. That was a good one, John, right there. It had good arm motion with that one. He is uh, one of only three Oakland players in the team's history in this city to drive in over 100 runs in three straight years. Shallow left center, and Amaral, after a long, long run, retires Matt Stairs. Two men left, no score after one. Albert Bell, Jeff Conine, and then Cal Ripken coming up. Back in Oakland, Orioles nothing, Athletics nothing. We start the second inning. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan, your Sunday night telecasters. And that's ball one to Albert Bell. I like broadcasters better. Your Sunday night broadcaster. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> it covers a broad scope. Well, hey, if you like it better, <laughs> you got it. Albert Bell hitting 304. Only two homers, 13 batted in. And that's one of the things the Orioles are really quietly excited about is that they've 
hit so extremely well and has been winning, even though Albert has not yet broken out. With the kind of big power numbers, you know that he's going to put up there. But, John, the good thing is that he's hitting well, and he's told me before the ball game that he's really swinging the bat well. He said everything's going great. Remember, he got off to a slow start last year, as did most of the Orioles. Change up from Mulder outside, three and one. He's a guy that, as you know, when he gets hot, he stays hot for a long period of time. I I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes for months at a time. Half a season that year, he hit. Check swing foul. Well, Albert, you know, by all accounts, it was not a very good year last year. Then you look at his numbers, he had 37 homers, 117 RBIs, and hit 297. But they, you know, you expect a guy like him in this modern era to hit 50 home runs. That's foul. He also walked 101 times. I think there were a lot of pitchers last year says, what are we pitching to this guy for? And especially in Camden Yards. I mean, that's a small ballpark, and he can hit it out in any direction. So there are a lot of times when you say, you're right, why should we pitch to him? Albert, a lifetime 296 batting average. Not just a guy who goes up this swing it from the heels. Three and two. Mulder delivers. Curveball. Wow, well, Bell fought off a tough pitch there on three and two. Beautiful night here in Oakland. The wind blowing in off the San Francisco Bay. This has been the home of the athletics since 1968, although it has a quite a different look to it now than it had for most of those years. They have rebuilt it for football. Going back in center field with Rich Becker. Albert Bell is retired. And that pitch there shows what Mulder can do. That ball moved just enough so he got it out on the end of the bat. Moved away from Bell. It looked like Bell had a good swing. Now watch this pitch. How it moves away. See it? Move away from Bell. He gets it right out on the end of the bat. And that's why he didn't yeah, hit it out of the ballpark. Good pitch there by Mulder. Yeah, if I'm a pitching coach, I tell him, make Albert hit it off the end of the bat. Right. Best place. Not Jeff Conine. Jeff hitting 379. Conine is a guy that will sometimes back up Cal Ripken at third base. Sometimes he'll plays some first base as he's doing tonight with Will Clark DHing. Oh, that's a pretty good looking changeup. 0 and 2. This kid looks like he has it all, John. And the, and the best thing is that he had no hesitation about pitching against the great Cleveland Indians team. They say he wasn't nervous, pitching in front of 40,000 plus at Jacobs Field. He say he just went out there and pitched a great game. He made two mistakes. He gave up two two-run homers. But other than that, he really pitched well. Well, and the thing that Art Howe likes about him and Rick Peterson, the athletics pitching coach, is that he doesn't seem to get rattled. Ooh. Oh, look out. Well, we'll see if that rattles uh, Kona. <laughs> he count now two balls and two strikes. In other words, he gave up the home runs. We'll take another look at this pitch from Mascat. Being worn by Ramon Hernandez. Look out. change up misses outside but Manny Ramirez hit a home run against him and the next guy Jim Tomey put him away in two or three pitches some young guys give up a long home run and then they're nowhere near the strike zone for several pitches and they hit the backstop three times <laughs> <laughs> right back to him he stayed with that change up and Conine is an easy out two down and here comes Cal Ripken and, John, the one record that I didn't even realize he had, he has started 16 consecutive All-Star games, which is a record. Oh, well, we know of all the other things that he has done, but 16 consecutive All-Star games. That's amazing. Cal is hitting 273. You know, when he got the three hits that night, eight nights ago in Minnesota, to reach 3,000 hits, he had not been hitting. Curveball and Ripken went around on it, said Ed Montague, the plate umpire, and it is 0 and 1. Well, he said he was struggling, John, in our interview this afternoon. He said basically, you know, the pressure of each at bat. And I think that was causing him to struggle a little bit. I mean, 16, 17 year veterans feel pressure as well. It's softly, Giambi to Mulder covering. And Mark Mulder has retired six straight Orioles. No score after one and a half. Ben Grieve comes up when we return. ESPN 
and Sunday Night Baseball presented by Gum Out. Orioles nothing, Athletics nothing. We move to the last of the second inning. Out here in the West Coast, a little better weather than we had last Sunday when we tried to give you the tour of Pacific Bell Park across the bay over in San Francisco. Blue skies, nothing but blue skies. This is more like oh. California weather. This is it. This is why we live here. Here's a, a look at what we're talking about. Blue skies over open. Not many fans availing themselves of the opportunity to uh, come out tonight, though. Ball in the dirt from Jason Johnson to Ben Greve. Greve, the former American League Rookie of the Year. Hitting 230. And the changeup too low. Well, both of these young guys have pretty good looking changeups. Well, I think if you're going to be successful in the major leagues now, I think you need to have a good changeup. You may not make it your best pitch or your second best pitch, but you need to have one. Down the left field line, racing out, boarded the long way. Wow! Only in California, where all the ballparks have a lot of space down the line. That was a fantastic play there by Bordick. I mean, he stretched out and made the catch. I mean, look how far he goes. I mean, he ends up catching the ball right here. I mean, look at that. Amazing. I mean, from his position at shortstop. I mean, he's playing him around the pool a little bit, and he had to go all this way and then make a diving catch. Look at this. He's got it all the way, though. I mean, he knows that he's going to have a chance. Great play there. Mm. Man. We should give him a couple of stars for that. Who does he think he is, the wizard? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Strike one to Ramon Hernandez. Hernandez he came up the uh, last part of last year and was very impressive. But so far this year, he's struggling. Only four hits in 34 at-bats, and he's another who has not been able to get any hits against the right-handed pitching I should say any hits he has two hits in 25 at bats against right-handed pitching so far so that's better than not any too far in with that fastball two and one the count no scores we're in the last of the second inning John, one thing we should note is that normally at a 5 o'clock start on the West Coast, you have a shadow problem. You really do not have one here as of yet, as this moment. You can see that the entire field is in the sunlight, so it's not a problem. On the outside with a fastball, 3 and 2. It may become a problem, you know, 3 or 4 innings from now, but at this point, really not a problem. Even though you look, it looks like the hitter's in the shadow, it really doesn't affect what goes on. Jeff Conine and Ramon Hernandez is retired. Two down. Let's take a look at the ball in the first inning that Cal Ripken was charged with an error on, and we'll show you why he had a problem with it. Now watch his first move. It's going to be this way. And you see right there, his momentum's going that way, and the ball's going to end up over here. That's because as an infielder, you read the pitch where the pitch is going, and that's how you get a good jump. The pitch was sinking down and away, so he thought the best he could do was pull it in the hole, but Tejada had enough hand action that he pulled it down the line, and that's what threw Cal off. But infielders always read the pitch. You see where it's sinking going inside, you think he's going to pull it, or it's sinking away, you think he's going to go the other way, and that's got Cal in trouble there, but he was doing his job. Eric Chavez, another one of the young Oakland sensations. Count of 0-2 now. Jason Johnson's had him wailing and a couple of curveballs. Well, that was real inside stuff there. So you mean a, an infielder knows where that pitch is headed and what the guy's likely to do with it. Exactly. I mean, you have to... Veterans do that more than, you know, young players. They, they read the pitch and get a good jump. But it worked against Ripken in that instance. What a play. We're going to the third. Will Clark coming up. No score. Sunday Night Baseball from Oakland. John Miller and Joe Morgan here with you. And the young sensation, Mark Mulder, to Will Clark. It is 0-1.
Will Clark hitting 385 and also with 15 walks, a 554 on base average. Curveball outside. One ball, one strike. Will Clark had some elbow surgery last August. And he says he is playing without pain and with everything working the way it's supposed to work for the first time in a long while. Nasty pitch right there. One and two. Is that a slider? Looks like a slider down and away. Right about knee high and right over the outside corner. So Clark against the 22 year old. Seeing it for the first time. And he whacks that one into right field. But caught by Stayers. Well, you can see Mulder hit his hands together out there because he did not get the pitch where Hernandez asked for it, and Will Clark hit a bullet to right field. Oh, Stairs really battling a tough sun out there right now. Now watch again. Watch where he's set up outside here, and look where the pitch is. Inside, and Will Clark rips it. Now look, he, we set up outside, fastball inside, and I mean, he just hit a bullet. Can't hit a ball any harder than that. Now Charles Johnson. He takes ball one. Johnson was just sizzling hot in the early days of the season. He's got five homers, 15 driven in, a 280 average. Change up in the dirt for a ball. 2-0 the count. Well, the Orioles, Joe, I mean, this is a club just loaded with not just talent, but experienced talent. The Orioles are the, the oldest club in the major by average age. They have six position players on their active roster who are older than 35, including that man, Harold Baines, Cal Ripken, Rich Amaral, Brady Anderson, Will Clark, B.J. Sirhoff. No other team has six guys, regular type position players. We're not talking pitchers. A lot of base hits there and a lot of smart players. He had to pick up by Tejada. He actually had to pick it up a second time and still got Charles Johnson. The ball deflected by Mulder over to him. Two down. Don't forget now, coming up on Wednesday. Wednesday night baseball on ESPN starting at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Sammy Sosa will get his uh, first look this coming week at Enron Field. They say it plays tiny. Sosa and the Cubs bag one of the Astros. Some of you will see Ken Griffey Jr. and the Reds up against Mike Piazza and the Mets. 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on Wednesday Night Baseball. Here's uh, Jesse Garcia. Remember when we were in Havana, Joe, at Estadio Latino Americano? Jesse Garcia ended up being one of the heroes in the extra innings, saving the win for the Orioles with a couple of great defensive plays at second base. One ball, one strike. In fact, it seems to me Will Clark, didn't Will Clark drive in the winning run in that game? No, Harold Baines, I think. See, I, I, wanna, I was waiting for you finally all these years to make a mistake. I think it was Harold Baines. Harold Baines. Harold Baines, Will Clark. No, they're different. <laughs> one of the <laughs> Orioles old guys. One of the old left-handed hitters. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Clark drove in a big run. I yeah, remember that. He, he did. Did he hit the double and then Baines Thank drove in? Thank you. See, All right. I just remember Harold Baines was the guy. Sounded like he broke his bat in that one. And right to Ben Green. Well, that's nine in a row retired by young Mark Mulder in his second Major League start. No score. Orioles nothing, Athletics nothing. We go to the last of the third inning from the Oakland Coliseum. The ninth place hitter, Frank Menachino, leads off for the Athletics against Jason Johnson. Hits one deep in the right field. Albert Bell battling the sun and the wind. Makes the catch. Nicely done there by Albert. Now let's go to our colleague Alvaro Martin. We're joined by Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's. Billy, right now we're on the third inning, typically in the home game. You're right downstairs working oh, out, trying to work out the stress of watching the team. How come today you're not working out? Oh, being Easter, I got that in the morning. But yeah, just no question. It's a good way to work off the stress and anxiety. Now, the free agents that have come to this team have come to this team and stayed, usually by taking less money they would have gotten elsewhere. How come? Well, I think a lot of it's the chemistry in this clubhouse. It's a great group of guys that we brought up through the system, and the guys like Bilardi and uh, Omar Oliveras really enjoyed their time, and uh, I think as much as anything, that was the reason. After 87 wins, what are the expectations coming, coming forth next year in the future? Well, it's a, lot, it's a change, but I think that we have expectations to compete during the entire season, and uh, hopefully at the end of the year, we'll be there. Thanks for joining us. 
gentlemen. All right, Alvaro, thank you. Alvaro Martin with Billy Bean. Now, Alvaro gets a lot of information in a short time. Yes, he does. You and me, three questions. <laughs> we need 20 minutes. Rich Becker, the hitter, he takes low and in for it. Now, I have to speak for myself. Me. Well, no, not I you. Agree. We're a team. If I miss the double play, then it's us. It's not Joe. It's Joe and John when they miss the double play. Oh, so now I missed all those double plays. <laughs> Man, three and one the count to Becker. Becker, the leadoff man, flied out to right center his first time. Miguel Tejada is on deck. High in the air, shallow left, Bordick. He never goes after a ball. At least they let the left fielder do earn his key. Two down. Becker, you got Becker talking to himself out there. You know, Bordick went on this conditioning program as we get another look at that. Pops it up. You oh, see no, Becker is no. really oh, upset. Oh, oh man. man. <laughs> <laughs> now Miguel Tejada. You know, Bordick went on this program that the Orioles strength and conditioning coach Tim Bishop had put B.J. Surhoff on. Cal Ripken goes through it. I mean, it. this is a tough program. But he says he's stronger, and, you know, he has a tendency during the season to kind of wear down. You know, a lot of players other than Cal Ripken, apparently, have had that tendency. There's Tim Bishop, the Orioles strength and conditioning coach, a guy who used to play in the Yankees farm system with guys like Bernie Williams, Gerald Williams, and the like. Just inside for a ball. Two and one. So Callan, for the first time in his career, had to do rehab on his back after the surgery this past winter and could not play basketball. He's always played a lot of basketball in the offseason. Dejada fouls one off to the right. Two and two the count. There's all of these sophisticated exercise programs now. I know the former Oriole great Hall of Famer, one of your fellow Hall of Famers, Joe, Brooks Robinson, said if he had it to do all over again, he would have taken better care of himself in the off-seasons. That's not the way it used to be done. Well, I, I've always said I admire, the, the thing I most admire about the players today is that they work out year-round. They stay in shape year-round. Whereas in the past, guys would go to spring training to get in shape. These guys stay in shape year-round. I, I, so I admire them for doing that. That's foul. But there, there's a question to that, though. I, I remember my track coach, Nick Garadakis, told me one day, he said, you know, once you get to a peak, there's only one way to go, and that's down. So it's almost impossible to stay in perfect shape for 162 games or a six-month period. And maybe that's why a lot of guys are having more injuries now than ever before, as they peak and then try to play the whole season at their peak level, and it's almost impossible to do that. In fact, I saw a nice article Randy Johnson was talking about his conversation with Warren Spahn, where he said Warren Spahn in those days, they didn't know anything, have all the technology that they have today, you know, how to ice your arm, all the things that they could do now to help a pitcher. And yet, they went out there and pitched 300 innings. So, I don't know, I, I, I admire the guys for what they're trying to do and stay in shape year-round. Tejada getting the walk. Now, here's the powerful Jason Giambi. And it's back to the bag for Tejada. Now, I mean, are you saying that maybe there's certain kinds of workout routines that are more suited to the rigors of baseball, baseball than, others? than others? Exactly. And I think that's why your conditioning coaches have to decide which ones are best for baseball. Part was right. Garcia, nice pickup over to Bordick for the put out on Tejada. And that ends the inning. We're going to the fourth inning, the top of the order. Coming up for Baltimore. Sweat, controversial edition. Baseball presented by Gum Out. Orioles nothing, athletics nothing. Here we go to the fourth inning, the middle innings. And Mark Mulder tantalizing Rich Amaral with a changeup. The 22-year-old Mulder up against the 38-year-old Amaral. I mean, he's up against a whole group of guys that have been playing professionally 
since he was in the first grade, Joe. John, now we're starting to see the shadows creep out across close to the mound. Now, with the pitcher being in the sunlight and then about 50 feet of shadows, it cut, does become a problem. And that's where the big problems come as far as I'm concerned, being able to see the rotation on a breaking ball. It's hard to see that. You can see the fastball because it just looks like a spot coming up there, but you can't see any rotation, and all of a sudden the ball breaks. See, there's the shadows we were talking about. Curveball outside, but now Harold Reynolds says that with the new baseball, you can see the rotation a lot better because of all of the, the writing on it. No, you can see the spot he's saying, not the rotation. See the rotation you can see there, but that spot may not help you if they grip it across seams. You won't see the spot, but I, I, I'm still trying to understand that philosophy, but, you know. Well, look, they didn't have that writing on the ball when I was playing, so I can't argue one way or the other. We no longer had the American League ball and the National League ball. We have one Major League Baseball with Bud Selig's signature on it. It's got the Major League logo on it. Well, see, the stitching is what's important, the rotation of the ball, because that tells you what the ball is going to do, whether it's going to sink, whether it's going to break, or whether it's going to ride up in the strike zone. On the fastball, high hop to short, Tejada. Throws out Amaral, and that's 10 in a row retired by Mulders. And we're enjoying the views from high above the Coliseum, right along the Nimitz Freeway, Highway 880. The aerial pictures provided by the Gum Out Aerial Can. There's the huge center field structure that was built for the Oakland Raiders football team. Here's Mike Bordick. Trying to become the first Orioles base runner against Mark Mulder. Change up. Now, he seems like he's got a lot of confidence in that pitch now. Well, he does. He's got a lot of confidence in everything. They said after the game that he pitched against Cleveland last week and won, they asked him, was he nervous? Was he, you know, pitching in front of 40,000 people against these Cleveland Indians? And he said, no. No big deal. He just went out and threw, threw his best stuff, as he said. He said, I was going to give him my best stuff and see what happened. Well, a lot of guys say that when they're asked. Well, that's true. But he actually went out and, and proved that he wasn't overawed or a case of nerves. I think the one thing I've said over the last few years is that I, I don't think players lack confidence anymore. I think a lot of the young players, when they come up, they have a lot of confidence in their ability. And they feel like, hey, if I'm here, I belong here. Mulder's been making the Orioles hit the ball. He's had only one strikeout, but nobody has reached. Okay. Change up away and it comes up with the fastball. Two and two to count to Mike Bordick. Good high fastball here. Just throws it right by Bordick. Bordick, the league's RBI leader, gets the first base hit of the game. And he's heading for second. He's in there with a double as Greve gets it back in. And, John, again, I, I believe it's easier to hit the fastball when the shadows are creeping between home plate and the pitcher's mound. And we'll take a look here. This is a high fastball. You see, it, you can see it. It looks, looks like a blur right there. You can hit that because it's a fastball. There's not a lot of movement. But if there's a big breaking ball, it's hard to judge the break on the ball and to pick up the spin. But Bordick does what he's been doing all year long, rips one down the left field line for a double. First hit of the game for either team, and here is B.J. Serhoff. Serhoff grounded out the first, his first time. And the slider for a strike, and it is 0-1. He has a great breaking ball. He has a great motion for left-handed, to get left-handed hitters out. Because the ball, he doesn't extend his arm out where you can pick it up very quickly. It looks like he kind of short-arms the ball when he throws that curveball against left-handed hitters. One ball, one strike. Mulder, this is only his second year in pro ball. Last year, he pitched in AAA. In his first year in pro ball, he, he started in AAA. Curveball, too low. He had an earned run average that was 10th best in the Pacific Coast League last year. Mark Mulder, they've got another young guy out of college who's in the minor leagues right now by the name of Barry Zito. And they think that he has a, a chance to be an outstanding pitcher. He might be here, depending on how his season goes, maybe by late summer with the Athletics. He's also left-handed, John. So they, they're two big stars of the future. 
could be Mulder and Zidi being left-handed. Zito, I'm sorry. So you're thinking about your favorite Italian restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Give me some of that big Zidi. <laughs> Back to the bag at second. Mike Bordick. I, I think I saw Zito pitch by our legs last year. Well, he went to USC. He was a first-team All-America as a junior at SC. Nice pitch right on the outside. Three and two now to B.J. Surhoff with Albert Bell on deck. That pitch had a lot of movement, but it wasn't a curveball. Let's take a look here. Well, it's just a fastball with a lot of movement. Fastball with a lot of movement. Look at that. It really sunk at the, at the last second. Three and two. No score. We're in the fourth. A runner in scoring position. That's Mike Bordick. Bounced over the mound, and it makes it throw base hit. And Bordick will score. The Orioles lead one to nothing on the base hit by B.J. Surhoff that somehow found a hole. That was a good pitch from Mulder. Down. But it was sinking down, and B.J. just put the ball in play and got it right back to the middle for a base hit. The watch, he bounces right over the head of Mulder, right on up the middle in the center field. A lot of room up the middle of the diamond if he gets past the pitcher. Good hitting there by B.J. because that was a good pitch from Mulder. Now Albert Bell, he flied out to center his first time. It went off the end of the bat. Change up from Mulder. Called the ball. One ball and no strikes. By the way, the plate umpire, if you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, isn't that Ed Montague, 25-year National League umpire? It is. But we no longer have National League or American League umpires. We only have Major League umpires. And Montague, who's from this area. And John, I think the umpires deserve a lot of credit for how they've made this transition. I mean, I think all the umpires have done a good job, the National League guys and the American League guys. Because let's face it, the National League guys were all Richie Phillips guys, so there was always a chance that there would be some animosity, but they've done a great job of blending in both the American League and the National League umpires. They've done a great job, and they need to be commended for that. Two and one the count. It's Jerry Lane, longtime National League umpire. He's over at third base tonight. Ted Barrett over at first base. He was an American League umpire. There's uh, Tony Randazzo. Over at second base. Bell. Base hit into left field. Then another change up, and he was on it. Now, Surhoff runs on Green, and he makes it without even getting a throw. Well, the one thing the A's do not have is a great defensive ball club, and they do not have a lot of speed in the outfield. And that hurts them in a lot of occasions. It hurts them here because you needed to get to that ball very quickly to keep their hall from running but I think the the Orioles know that they can run on the outfield of the A's and watch he gets the ball quick enough but he he takes a look at third and then he throws in the second base but here's BJ Serhoff he's made up his mind all the way he's going all the way they know that they can run on the A's outfielder and he goes into third base safely but the good thing for Grieve he saw he didn't have a shot at third so he did hold Albert Bell at first which keeps the double play in order and that's B.J. Surhoff, 35 years old. But he's, he may be in as good a shape as he's ever been in, in his entire career. And Surhoff has been playing like a guy who's in the best shape of his, uh, his life with the Orioles these last uh, couple of years. B.J. last year hit 308 with 107 RBIs. Like his uh, best home run years have been the last two years. We've never a guy who hit many home runs from playing with Milwaukee, but he went to Camden Yards and sud suddenly began hitting the long ball. Well, Camden Yards has that effect on some good hitters. If you're just a good hitter, it turns you into a little better hitter and a power hitter. Here's Jeff Conine. Well, Rick Peterson, the pitching coach, has visited with young Mark Mulder, the infield back looking for the double play. Starts him with that changeup. Conine hit a changeup right back to Mulder in the second inning. He's 0 for 1. One run is in. A double by Bordick. Surhoff 
bounced one over the middle to get him home. Bell with a base hit to left, sending Surhoff to third. Cal Ripken is on deck. Another change up. That is foul down the right field line, high in the air. All went to the count. Here's Surhoff, the runner at third. And Albert Bell over at first base, being held in the bag by Jason Giambi. A couple of big, strong guys right there. And Jeff Conine, a one-time All-Star Game MVP. The young lefty from Michigan State, Mark Mulder, with an 0-2 count. Change up off the outside. One ball and two strike. Also, you got to kind of keep an eye on Albert Bell over at first base. Albert stole 17 bases for the Orioles last year. One and two, the count to Conine. Oh, man. That's a beautiful slider right there. He set him up perfectly. Change up away, and then a fastball, he moved away. And then he comes right back in hard with a slider. Watch this. See the rotation? There's that hold you can see in the slider every once in a while, but you can't see it in this kind of... with these shadows. So great pitch there by Mulder. Back inside. And he'd almost gotten away from pitching some of the right-handers inside. He was doing that early in the ballgame, John. Then he went away from that, but he came back to it when he really needed a strikeout. And he gets it right there. So now Cal Ripken. Now, grounded out to first, his first time. Ah! It's a strike. And now, did some uh, extra work before the game with hitting instructor Terry Crowley before batting practice in the cage underneath, and then they went back in after batting practice. And, John, you see all these hitters taking that breaking ball when he throws it because they cannot pick up the spin on it with the shadows. I think that's a very effective pitch. Like we saw him strike Conan out with that hard slider. You cannot see the spin on it, so you can't adjust to it very well. Most hitters look fastball and hit hit off the fastball and hit change-ups. You know, you work off the fastball and you adjust to the breaking ball. But to adjust to it, you have to be able to see the rotation. Here's the look now from the home plate area. And Cal Ripken with a base hit to left field. Well, he went to that change-up once too often, John. Surhoff scores, Bell to second, and that gives the Orioles a 2-0 lead. Make no mistake about it, Cal Ripken Jr. was sitting over there watching him pitch to Conine with the changeup. And he's ready for it. There's the changeup. And Cal just rips it in the left field. This is a good swing here by Cal. He doesn't try to do much with his legs or his, any part of his body. He just uses his hands and rips this ball to left field. He waited back and hit it with his hands. And you can do that on a changeup. That was number 3,007 for Cal Ripken. Now here is Will Clark. Breaking ball, high and tight. Clark ripped one to the right fielder, Matt Stairs, his first time. He's 0 for 1. 2 to nothing. the Orioles ahead. Ripken getting the RBI. And it always warms a manager's heart anytime one of his hitters knocks in a run with two down. That's a real clutch hit. Out of play off the left field line. One ball, one strike to Will Clark. The Oakland Coliseum. There's been a lot of great baseball played in this ballpark since the A's moved here 32 years ago. Jason Johnson, the Baltimore pitcher, now will be pitching with a lead for the first time tonight. One ball, one strike, Clark. Right down the first baseline. One ball, two strikes. The Athletics, who had three consecutive world championships, 72, 73, 74. The Athletics of uh, Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando, Catfish Hunter, Vita Blue, Ken Holtzman, Gene Tennis, and the like. And a great pitching staff, a great pitching staff. Raleigh Fingers coming in out of the bullpen to wrap it up. Raleigh got the MVP in the 74 World Series when they won their third in a row. 
Ooh, the third ball. Got it. But the Orioles get two runs and four hits. John Jaha, Matt Stairs, and Ben Green. Three powerful hitters coming up for the Athletics, but they are trailing 2-0. Thanks, Bill. The Yanks win one in Toronto. The Blue Jays won the first two games of that series with complete game victories. But the Yanks salvaged the final one, 10 to 7, the final score. John Jaha, the hitter for Oakland, facing Jason Johnson. By the way, hitting home runs from both sides of the plate in the same game. Well, there's the the champion of that. Eddie Murray did it more often than any player in history. Murray, one of three. 3,000 hit 500 home run men in Major League history. It's Aaron, Mays, and that man, Eddie Murray. John, we're seeing more of records than ever in the last couple of years, especially home run records. Yeah, not even the last couple of years, Joe. I think it's just like the last few days. Yeah, like Friday. <laughs> <laughs> On Friday, in case you missed it, I guess Mo Vaughn, Tim Salmon, and Troy Gloss hit home runs in the same inning. Yeah. Twice. Which, which, yeah, the same inning twice. Yeah. Same game. Same game. <laughs> That's it. Unbelievable. That's two home runs apiece. Ripken throws out Jaha one away, and here is Matt Stairs. Powerful left-handed swinger. He flied out to shallow left center his first time. Now this guy, he's left-handed, Joe. Uh, very powerful. Does his swing remind you of, of say, your swing at no, all? No, no. <laughs> I mean, he is. He lets it go, John. <laughs> he doesn't get cheated up there. I mean, I love the Oh, he yeah. swings. I Got under it. it. Yeah. Albert Bell. And that is on number two. I love watching Matt Stairs hit. He gives you a little Sadahara O. I mean, he raises that left, that front leg and kicks it up pretty high. And then, I mean, he doesn't get cheated. He lets it all go. I mean, look at this. He's not trying to hit a single right there. Look at that. I mean, that's not your single swing right here. So he's not trying to poke that ball to left. No, he wasn't trying to go the other way. He's trying to really hit it hard. But that's, that's the way the A's team is. I mean, they're a pretty powerful group of guys. I mean, they all let it go. And when they're on top of their game, I mean, they're hard to beat. I mean, last year they got everything going, and a lot of people have picked them to win the West this year. Matt Steers had the second highest home run total from a Major League player born in Canada last year with 38 home runs. Only Larry Walker, when he hit 49 for the Rockies in 97, hit more among all Canadian-born players. Matt Steers from St. John, New Brunswick in Canada. Fredericton High School. Ah! Uh, New, New Brunswick, isn't that where uh, Ted Williams used to have a, a fishing place up there, a fishing camp or a fishing cabin, whatever. I'm not a fisherman, John, I don't know. You never went fishing no. with Ted Williams? No. It's a, you were always too busy staying in shape for the next season. <laughs> I can't go, Ted, I'm working out. Sorry. Three and two the count to Ben Green. He fouled out to the shortstop his first time. And he's got the athletics first base hit against Jason Johnson. Be sure to tune in Wednesday Night Baseball on ESPN 2 at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. It'll be the Dodgers and the Atlanta Braves. Chipper Jones up against Sean Green and Gary Sheffield and company from Atlanta. Some of you will see the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Philadelphia Phillies for Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. Do that. Seven Pacific, seven Eastern, four Pacific on ESPN 2. A lot of baseball on ESPN then on this uh, coming Wednesday. Did we say we had a doublehead on ESPN also? Yes. Wow. Here's Ramon Hernandez. Big cut, fouls one back to the screen. John Ben Grieve, who was rookie of the year for the A's two years ago, he got off to a slow start last year. He bounced back and had a pretty good season, but he's off to another slow start this year. Grieve at first. Ramon Hernandez trying to shake himself out of an early season slump. Johnson tries the curve, didn't work. One ball, one strike. Now, on ESPN on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we've got a ball game. 
Houston in Houston. And then with the Sammy Sosa going against Houston right. at Enron Field. And at the same time, the Braves against the Dodgers and Braves on ESPN2. Curveball rifled into right center field. Albert Bell over to cut it off. Green will have to uh, stop at third. And that is the first hit this year against a right-handed pitcher for Ramon Hernandez. He's been needing that one. This is a hanging breaking ball. And it's good hitting there by Hernandez. I mean, he waits on it. You see the overhand oh, curveball. He waits on it and goes the other way. It's getting a little easier to see now because the pitcher's also in the sun in the shadow, so it's easier to pick it up. Eric Chavez, change up too low. And I said easier, not easy. Now we're we're looking at very young players here, Joe. Greaves at 30, he's 23. Ramon Hernandez who just got the single, he's at first, he's 23. There's Greaves. There's Hernandez. And the batter, Chavez, is 22. Who got under it. Down into the corner. To the warning track. To the wall. He's got it. Oh, boy. Two men left. Still 2 nothing Baltimore as we go to the fifth. Who has come out, takes us to Atlanta for the Braves and the Pirates. Andres Galarraga. What an incredible comeback for him. His seventh home run of the year. Ray Maddox the win. John Rocker his third save of the year. As you get the out right there, and the Braves go on a win, five to three. Thanks, Bill. As we return to action now, Charles Johnson here in Oakland, leading off for Baltimore. Taking ball one. Johnson he is 0 for 1 in the game. Mark Mulder. Oh, look out. Over at second. And Aquino and Johnson is gone. One away. And John, something overlooked in that last inning is Albert Bell made two good plays, not just the one we saw him in the inning, but he cut off the ball up the gap to save a run. And here's the catch to end the inning. That ball just oh, kept carrying. And when you get the ball up high, the state above the rim, the wind is blowing out. And that was a tough play. You see he has his sunglasses down. The sun is still bothering the right fielder. So an excellent play there by Albert Bell to end the inning. And Garcia showing bunt, taking low. One ball and no strikes. Well, that's really something about uh, Andres Galarraga. Andres is hitting 339. And, and, and it's not like he's some young guy either. From the mass cam. That's too high. 3 and 0 oh to Garcia. Amaral, the leadoff man on deck. Andres has seven homers and 19 RBIs after missing a full season battling cancer. That's too low. So the first walk allowed by Mulder goes for the ninth place hitter. John, let's take a look at Albert Bell's two at-bats here. In the first at-bat, this is a breaking ball. See how he slows his bat down, and that's what a pitcher does to you. That makes the 69-mile-an-hour bat, bat speed right there. Now, he gets a fastball, a pitcher makes you speed up your bat, and he's able to do that 84 miles an hour, and he gets a base hit. So you have to be a, a pitcher. That's what a pitcher does. He makes you change your bat speed, tries to slow your bat down, then speed it up. If you're not able to compensate, then you're not going to be a pretty much of a hitter. Garcia back to the bag at first. Amaral, the leadoff man, has struck out and grounded out to short in this game. Two to nothing, Baltimore leading. Again, Garcia back to the bag at first. Well, the Oriole fans are maybe wondering, where's Brady Anderson tonight? I was wondering that. Joe's wondering as well. Oriole fans and Joe. There Brady. he is. He's here. Brady's now 36 years of age, although he, he doesn't look it. Ha! And that's called strike to Amaral, 0-1. But they've got a flight after this game to Chicago. They play tomorrow night in Chicago, so Mike Hargrove, he's got such a veteran ball club, he wants to keep guys fresh. So Brady, with the left-handed going tonight, gets the night off, or at least the early part of the night off. 
And there's another aspect of it. Rich Amaral in this ballpark has always done well. This could be two. There's one. And if you know the first, double play. Not tonight for Amaral, who's 0 for 3. 2 to nothing. Orioles after four and a half. Athletics nothing. Sunday night baseball from Oakland. The Athletics turning a nice double play to end uh, the Orioles' fifth inning. John, watch what happens. Watch the second baseman go out to meet the ball. That's what I like. He gets the ball sooner, gets him out of the runner's way, and it lets it give him a chance to make the double play. When a runner is coming down on you and you stand there at the bag, he knows where to find you. Minichino did a good job of coming across the bag and avoiding the runner. Well, here is Minichino out of the University of Alabama. He's been around for a long time. He was originally with the White Sox organization. And then the Athletics drafted him in the Rule 5 draft back in uh, before the 1998 season. He led the Crimson Tide at batting average back in 1992. A career minor leaguer. Finally got a little look-see in the big leagues last year, just for a brief time. Well, Manichino getting a lot of uh, face time with Randy Velarde down with an injury. That's out of play. Yeah, Velarde is there every day, second baseman, that he's been on the disabled list. And that's when I asked Art how how come the Athletics are 7 and 11, one of the first things he pointed out, he said, hey, Randy Velarde means a lot to this lineup. The second place hitter, a veteran, and he can do a lot of things on a young ball club. And he's the guy who's been around a long time. Down the right field line, that is in there. Base hit against Jason Johnson. Then Aquino's going to challenge Albert Bell. He makes it. A double for Menachino. Down the A's get the leadoff hitter on here, but let's go back and take a look at Ben Grieve. I think he's one of the keys to this ball club. Let's take it. This is his first time up. Take a look at this swing. Fastball up in the zone, 85 miles an hour. Now he gets a base hit. That was a pop-up. This is a base hit he gets. Fastball down a little bit. Look at that, 89 miles an hour. It enforces my theory that everyone's bat speed is faster down than it is up. Here's Rich Becker. Fastball for a strike. I think most of the hitters that we've watched over the last two years with bat track, we've seen that they have better bat speed when the ball is down about waist high and below than they have when it's up around the letters. Runner in second, nobody out. Becker 0 for 2. He's the leadoff man. Curve ball from Johnson, low and in. One ball, one strike. So with that theory, Joe, would it not stand to reason that if the umpire is called higher strikes the pitch that would have a better chance yeah, definitely well help that's why the american league was known as a high ball league they could throw the high fastball and they could get the hitters out fastball too low and that was the theory that was the american league was the high ball league so um, i think that most hitters like the ball down now and i think a reason for that is because most hitters have a little uppercut in their swing because they're hitting more home runs now and it's easier to get elevation on that pitch around the waist and below if you're swinging up than it is on the high fastball. Two and one the count. Change out. Strike two call. Johnny, it used to be that right-handed hitters were basically high ball hitters and left-handed hitters were low ball hitters. Now I'm finding that the right-handed hitters have become low ball hitters as well. And I think it's all because of the smaller ballparks and the fact that they're trying to get the ball in the air. Two and two. Fastball fouled back to the screen. He jammed him with it. Two balls, two strikes. Well, Jim Palmer, the great former Oriole right-hander in the Hall of Fame. High fastball. Yeah. I mean, uh, that high riding fastball. Riding fastball. Very successful with it. And I think he would be very successful with it today as well. But if guys never swung at it, would it ever be called a strike? Good point. I mean, guys might have had a little more reason to swing at it in those days, right? Yeah. Well, I really believe that when you're talking about helping the pitchers, there are two things you can do. One, you can raise the mound halfway to where it was before. You can also make sure that you call that fastball that is a strike. The one just below the letters there. That is a strike. I think that will help the pitchers, even with the smaller ballparks. I think you'll get, you know, more outs 
that way with the high fastball than you will on the low fastball. Because a lot of times we've taught pitchers now to try to stay down. But when you do that, you lose a little velocity on your fastball, and it lets the hitter catch up with it. The smaller ballparks, everyone says, well, you got to keep the ball down. You have to keep the ball down. And the hitters know that. Two and two to Becker. He's got Manichino at second. Nobody out. Becker with a new piece of wood. High fastball is too high up around the shoulders, and it's a full count. Now, Johnson's got a lot of reasons here to throw a strike to Becker because Tejada has got a lot of pop in his batters on deck, and then the big sluggers, Giambi, Jaha, Stairs, Green. He could get in a lot of trouble in a hurry here. Three and two, and he walks him. Threw him the changeup. It's interesting, Joe. I mean, he treated Becker like he was one of those big power hitters. Well, he has a lot of confidence in his changeup, but I think that was a case where, with a two-run lead, he needed to go after Becker, especially with the fact that you're getting to the meat of the order now, and the hotter you miss has a lot of power. There's the changeup, and it's down low for ball four. All right, now you've got Tejada. He's a right-handed hitter. He hit a grand slam earlier this week in Cleveland. We know he's got a lot of pop. He had 20 home runs last year. On the other hand, you've got your big left-handed batting slugger, one of the top RBI men in the game right now, Jason Giambi on deck. So if you're Art, how do you, do you bunt Tejada to move these runners over? No, I don't think he will. But they've been having trouble scoring runs, so he may do something different. Of course, this is the American League, Joe. Right. Very rarely do they give, give up you an mean out. Give away an out? Yeah. Very oh, rarely. Nuts? So we'll see. Ripken is pulled in at third. It's a hot of squares. Pops the bun in the air, and it's gone. I actually, I think this is a good play. I'm surprised that he's doing it, but I think it's a very good play simply because you've got Giambi, you've got Jaha coming up next, and you stay out of the double play here. You move the runners over to second and third, and then all Giambi has to do is put the ball in play to get you a run. Over at second base, that's Menachino. He led off the inning with a double. There's Becker at first. He walked. Nobody out. Tejada has been on base twice. He reached on what was scored an error against Ripken in the first inning, and he walked in the third. Miguel Tejada. Another name to remember in this Oakland ball club. Still looking for the bunt. A curveball very high. One ball, one strike. He had 21 homers and 84 RBIs last year. And he's only 23 years old. They've got five players in the game tonight through the athletics who are 23 or younger. That's a young team. And a lot of potential in those young players. I mean, Tejada's a guy that Art House says when he learns the strike zone, becomes more patient, he's going to be in the mode of, mode of Alex Rodriguez, Derek Jeter, and Garcia Parra. That's a big order. One and one. Not bunting now. He lifts a high foul out of play. Off to the right. One ball and two strikes. Well, what I was hoping there is that Johnson would just lay the ball in there thinking Tejada was going to bunt and maybe he could hurt him with it. So, so you're, you're rooting for Tejada to do some damage against Jason Johnson? No, I said that's why he took the bunt off. Oh, I see. Oh, Art Howe was... Uh, yes, Art Howe. Okay. You're in Art Howe's mind here. Yeah, I kept the bunt sign on. Okay. <laughs> One and two the count. Too low. I'm going to have to pay more attention to what you're saying from now on. Yeah, I just kept the bunt sign on because, like I said, I thought it was a good play to try to get back in this ball game, and you've had trouble hitting with runners in scoring position. They've left 72 runners in their last 10 ball games. I mean, that's a lot of runners to be left on base. They had the bases loaded the last two nights in the ninth inning and couldn't, you know, come from behind in those ball games. So you're leaving a lot of base runners. All right. Two and two the count. Right along the first base line, but foul. And they've been leaving guys on, and they've been striking out a lot. Right. Oakland has struck out before tonight. They had struck out nearly 50 times more than their pitchers had struck out the opposition. They're averaging like 8.3 strikeouts a ball game. I mean, that's, uh, you know what I mean? that's a lot of strikeouts, but that's the way that they are. They really attack the ball. They're a lot of, they're aggressive hitters. And they attack the ball, so they do strike out a lot. Yeah. Although with all those strikeouts, it's more like the ball's been attacking them. <laughs> They've been attempting to attack it. 
Two men on, nobody out. Tejada, too high. Well, now it's a full count, three and two. Oh, did I tell you I took the butt off? Yeah, okay. I took the butt off. I, I was inside your mind. Okay. Ron Washington, the third base coach, flashes a sign to Tejada. There is the slugger, Jason Giambi, second in the league in RBIs at the start of the day. He's on deck. A good situation here if you want to, to put a hit and run on. I was thinking that myself. Manichino and Becker, the runners, they are not running. Right center field, Albert Bell. Catch! He misjudged it. And almost forced out Becker at second base. It is a base hit for Tejada, and the bases are loaded with nobody out. I think what happened there is he thought the ball was going to sink quicker than it did, but he was able to at least keep it in front of him. I'm not so sure he ever had a chance to catch that ball, John. It was hit so hard. But it looked like the ball was going to carry, you know, short. And now watch where the ball, see that ball is sinking. Look how quickly it's sinking. He definitely started back on it. He definitely misjudged where it was going to end up. See, he starts back. He thinks it's going deeper. And it was shallow, but the ball did sink very sharply. He was going over to cut it off, so he misjudged where it was going to land. And they almost forced out Rich Becker at second base. But that ball was hit very hard by Tejada. So the bases are loaded. Glad I took the butt sign off. Yeah. I've, re I've realized now that that's usually the best signs you give are the ones you take off. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy Ellis, the Baltimore pitching coach, has visited the mound. Tim Morrell, right-hander up in the bullpen. Well, the Athletics are set up nicely, trailing two to nothing. And they've got their top slugger at the plate, Jason Giambi, with the bases loaded and nobody out. The young Jason Johnson. Change up inside. And I think this is a great at bat for Jason Giambi to be patient. You have to be patient. You do not have to do much. Make the pitcher come to you. play one ball one strike the three runners Menachino at third Becker at second and Tejada at first good movement on that fastball from Johnson Giambi was looking for it but that ball moved out of the strike zone a little bit looked like a pretty good pitch to hit a halfway there and then jumped out of the zone he jammed him with that fastball and had a little extra on that ball and is ahead of the count now one ball and two strikes this pitch is a good pitch from Johnson. It's inside. It's actually a ball. But you can see Giambi goes up, tries to get it, and just barely gets a piece of it. Giambi, one hit in eight career at-bats against Johnson. The one hit, though, was a home run. One ball, two strikes. Center oh! field, plenty deep enough to Amaral to score Menachino. He tags up, comes in to score, also tagging up Becker. He goes to third, and it is 2-1 Orioles. That was a good pitch by Johnson and good job by Giambi to put it in play and put it in play deep enough to allow Becker to move over to third. Now watch, fastball in. Look at that. As well, it moves back over the plate just enough that Giambi is able to get enough wood on it to get it deep enough in the center field for a sacrifice fly and to move Becker over to third. 24th RBI of the year for Giambi, tying him with Mike Bordick. At the top of the league, there's Bordick over at third with Ron Washington. Holding it first in the play was Tejada. Now John Jaha, who has really been struggling this year. Tonight he is 0 for 1 with a walk. Curveball from Johnson, too high. Well, if you're Jaha, your job now is to make sure you get the ball in the air. You do not want to hit a ground ball. He doesn't run well, and he's hurting anyway. You have to make sure that you do not hit the ground ball that the Orioles are looking for. You've got to make sure you get a pitch that you can hit in the air. What about sending Tejada? For Charles Johnson, is awfully tough to run against. High and tight. But I think he could steal a base on Johnson because his delivery allows, you know, the runner to get a pretty good jump at first base, and as good as Charles throws, He's had, you know, the Orioles have not held runners well. He's won for eight and stolen bases, you know, throwing the runners out this year. 
And that's directly related to the fact that they do not hold runners as well as they would like. Doing all the count. Tejada with a long lead from first. He's not running. Strike at the knees. Two and one. That's two and one, Joe. He's, he's running. He's got to be running. Well, here's a good fastball. That's a pretty good pitch to hit. Looks like it's in the middle of the plate. Just above the knee. There's Tejada. I'm sending him now. You're sending him? Yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't think so. But we'll see. Maybe you think more like Art Howe than I do. I think there's still a danger with Charles Johnson behind the plate. I mean, he cuts down on all teams' base running attempts. All right, well, I'm sending him now. Definitely. <laughs> Three and one. <laughs> so you're still not sending him? I'm not sending him, but I think it's, you know, wait a minute. I'm trying to think like Art Howe. Well, you're just... You're just Station to station baseball. That's go. <laughs> I'm sending him. He's going. He's going. Yeah. Foul right back beneath us. Three and two. Well, Art Howe was thinking like you there. He's sending. And I mean, it's a good idea to try to stay out of double play with Jaha at the plate because if he hits a ground ball, it's more than likely they would be able to turn it if the hot is not running. Yeah. Three and two, he's got to send him again, doesn't he? Well, if you send him three and one, you definitely have to send him three and two. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. Matt Stairs, a left-handed hitter on deck. There he goes. Strike three call. Two for second. Oh, man. Charles Johnson came up and fired a strike to second base. Right on the money. Good job by Tejada to, to steal that base, but that's the danger when you... But see, he gets a good jump because Johnson takes a long time to deliver the ball. And Johnson, look at this, he oh, fires man. a strike. Right Ooh. Well, nice job at second base. But Garcia, look, he blocks him off the bag. Well, I don't know if he actually tagged it, but he got the... No, no, he no. blacked... Watch him. He, yeah, but his hand never touches the bag. He's blocked him off right there. Very close call. Matt Stairs, the hitter. Popped up foul. And right over toward Bill King's booth. The longtime voice of the Oakland Athletics. Great veteran, Bay Area broadcaster. Oh, and one the count to Matt Stairs. Now, this is where... The Athletics have not been getting the clutch hit. Matt Stairs, 0 for 2 tonight against Jason Johnson. Runners at second and third. That's too low. And it looks to us like the A's did get a break on that call at second base. That Tejada could well have been called out. One ball, one strike to Stairs. Line. Could be trouble. Sir Hawk. And he's got it. Another sensational defensive play by the Orioles. This time from B.J. Sirhoff. And Art Howe didn't think so. He thought it bounced. Let's take a look. Yeah. Uh. Mike Bordick takes a called strike from Mark Mulder. Here we go to the Orioles sixth inning. Bordick has flied out and doubled and uh, scored a run. The Orioles lead two to one. Some controversy on the final play of the Athletics fifth inning is Bordick in the right field and right at the edge of the shadows, Matt Stairs. Now, Art Howe came out and uh, he's wearing a microphone. Let's listen to his argument. Sir, are you sure on that catch? Didn't he short hop that ball? I don't think so, Art. I, I can see him as he's got it in the club. I... You know, with the reaction to the fans, I'm second guess myself. Yeah, I, 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 I think I he's short sure off the ball. It cost us two runs. Well, what do you think? Well, he didn't catch the ball. I'll tell you what I think. Because anytime, if you go with your fingers pointed down, you can't watch him. He gets up, he's ready to throw. And he says, oh, okay, I caught it. <laughs> if we can go back, I can show you another reason you, can, you know he didn't catch it. Is because the fingers are pointed down. Now watch him point the fingers down on his glove. You can't catch a ball like that. See the fingers, how they're pointed down? He's trying to trap it. You can't get your fingers underneath if they're pointed down toward the ground. And that's the way his 
glove was. But I must admit, it was a tough play. It wasn't an easy call. And I, I like what happened there. Jerry Lane said, look, maybe I'm second-guessing myself, but I thought he caught it. That's, sure that's a better response than Zerha sure, almost. Rips one right center field. Max stands on the run. Nice play. No question about that catch. Two down. But Art Howe said, you know, you cost us two runs, which he did. And he also asked Jerry, could you get some help on the play? And I don't think you can get help. I mean, unless you, you have to make a call. Here's a nice running catch by Matt Stairs in right center field. Days aren't known for their defense, but nice play there by Matt Stairs. Stairs doesn't do a bad job out there. Right, he got robbed of two RBIs, though, and a base hit. Yeah. Here's Albert Bell. Check swing. Up the first base line. And they're going to let roll now. Well, good hustle there by Bell. Made him let it roll. <laughs> you didn't want to stick your hand down in front of this oncoming train. If he didn't run hard, I think you, Mulder would have picked that ball up quickly. Watch. Now watch Bell get out of the box. If he doesn't run at all, you watch right here. Mulder has a chance to pick the ball up. But by the time he gets there, Bell is there too, you see? So good hustle gets him another swing here. Because Mulder could have pitched that ball up in fair territory if he wasn't running. Had Mulder actually gone ahead and tried to pick that ball up, he might be out by the right field <laughs> foul pole about now. <laughs> might be calling righty next week. <laughs> One strike to Albert Bell. That's a foul out of play. Oh, and two. Albert has flied out, and he is single. In the Orioles' two-run fourth-inning rally. They lead the game 2-1. to one. We've got a couple of young pitchers going here today. Both recently brought up in the minor leagues, and they're both pitching extremely well against very powerful lineups. Mark Mulder of the Athletics against the great Albert Bell. Way outside for a ball. Albert Bell, I mean, this guy, in the last five years, he's had the highest total of extra base hits over any five-year period since Lou Gehrig. He's had 441 extra base hits in the last five years. I mean, that's almost an average of 90 extra base hits a year. One of those years wasn't even a full year of the, the strike year. Up and away to Albert. Babe Ruth had the highest extra base hit total over any five-year period. 476 back in the early 20s. Lou Gehrig and then Albert Bell. He's a pretty select company. The shortstop, Tejada. Good job by Mulder. For the Athletics down by one. We go to the last of the six. Ben Grieve will be coming up. Two to one. The Orioles lead Oakland. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball tonight from Oakland. The Orioles two, the Athletics one. Next Sunday, we'll be back here in California as the Atlanta Braves take on the San Diego Padres. We'll check in with the big cat, Andres Galarraga, league MVP, Chipper Jones, and then there's Andrew Jones and his magic. Bill Nevin, the Padres home run leader, and the Padres are leading in the night. We'll see Trevor Hoffman. That's next Sunday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, from San Diego. And Tony Gwynn's back in the lineup. Yeah, but I saw Tony Gwynn hitting the 143, John. I think they transposed those numbers. It's probably 431. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's getting old now, Joe. I've never seen Tony Gwynn hitting 143. You know what You know what happened to him? He's almost as old as you and me now. <laughs> <laughs> and he can still hit. I think that 143 was just a mistake. Well, he got a hit today for the Padres. He had to get a hit today. The final score was 11 to 10 in Houston. Yeah, I think Diego won. I thought you even had a hit in that game. I had three hits. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't hit the ball well in any of them. Ben Grieve fouls one back out of play against Jason Johnson. Johnson just up for the minor leagues to make this start. And just in case the bullpen's going to be ready, uh, ready B.J. Ryan, a left-hander, is warming up. He looks like an old-time fireballer with those socks up there like that. With the pants up high, I should say, showing a lot of socks. Look at that. Most guys don't do that. No. Now. They wear their pant legs all the way down to the shoes. Yeah. Rod Hendricks alongside the Orioles longtime bullpen coach, former catcher, right in second. And Garcia throws out Ben Reeve. Reeve is one for three in the game. You know, I think Elrod's been there longer than they had a bird on their hat. I mean, he's been there forever. Elrod Hendricks. Elrod came to the Orioles and he was playing in the Mexican League. He was the Babe Ruth of the Mexican League. 
at 48 home runs in the Mexican League. And Earl Weaver always was looking for a left-handed hitting catcher who could hit with power. And Elrod was his guy. And Elrod has been with the Orioles for a long, long time. Great ambassador for the game. Albert Bell battling the elements out there, and he hangs on to it. And Ramon Hernandez is retired for out number two. Well, it's gone from a tough sun field to a dark field out there. It's too early for the light to take hold out there in right field. The sun has moved up into the stands now, not so much on the field. There, there are those little patches in front of Albert of sun that's, well, that's coming through the stands. Yeah, and that causes you a problem. Curveball to Eric Chavez, and it is in the dirt for ball one. But Joe, if you ever have a little gathering, if you want somebody to come and spread the gospel of baseball, Elrod Hendricks is your man. Okay. I mean, he's gone everywhere around the Baltimore, Washington area. And he's he's almost as popular as any of the Orioles star players. 32 years in the Orioles uniform. Man. Elrod Hendricks out there in the bullpen. Well, that's one of the reasons why they got that bullpen busy. Johnson has thrown 103 pitches. Well, he's done a great job with the with his pitches. I mean, 103, but he's still leading. It was interesting. I, I had a conversation with Davey Johnson, and he says that he's trying to get his Dodger pitchers to think nine innings rather than seven innings. Ooh. Chavez went up out of the strike zone. But he's also thinking 125 pitches. That's what he's trying to get them to think in terms of. Give me 125 innings and a nine-inning ball game. You see, that's one of the problems you face a team like Oakland. They got a lot of patient guys. Right. They'll take you into deep count. And here's Johnson. He's over 100 pitches, and he's only in the sixth inning. Yeah, and then you'll find that, I mean, the Yankees are the best at that. The Yankees always take people into a deep count. Sammy Ellis, the Orioles pitching coach. Well, you know who's used a much greater economy of pitches so far this year to, to great success? Randy Johnson. Well, that's because no one can touch him anyway. Down on strike, so Johnson's still got a lot left. Three up, three down. We're going to the seventh inning. Jeff Conine and then Cal Ripken coming up. Two to one, Orioles. It is... And the first pitch of the Baltimore seventh inning to Jeff Conine. He hit a pop fly into shallow center. It was caught, and there is one away. John, I, I saw another interesting fact about Cal Ripken. There has to be millions of them by now, a thousand. That he's one of only six players of the 24 who have 3,000 hits that has a b lifetime batting average under 300. Yeah. Well, Cal has played here, 0 and 1. That makes it tough. I mean, you get 3,000 hits. I mean, you have to play a long time. You have to have a lot of at bats. But only six players of the 24 have batting averages under 300. And now, Cal Ripken, of course, is one. Yeah. Yastrzemski. Yastrzemski. Go Robin, ahead. Robin Yao. Yes, go ahead. You're doing fine. The second base, Frankie Menachino. Throws out Cal Ripken. So Cal is one for three. He did single home a run in the fourth, the run that has the Orioles leading this game right now, two to one. Will Clark coming up. All right, who did I leave out? Eddie Murray. <laughs> Eddie Murray's right, lifetime is 287. Okay. Lou Brock. David Winfield. Dave Winfield. Yeah. Those I'm surprised the by the Lou Brock. Yeah, 293 yeah. lifetime average. Eddie Murray, two, nine, 287. Yastrzemski, 285. Yant, 285. And Winfield, 283. And Cal Ripken, Jr., 278. Well, you know, I saw in a, an article about Ripken after he got his 3,000 hits as we watch Will Clark with a count of 1 and 0. Oh. Will is 0 for 2 in the game. Two down. Nobody out. Baltimore, 7. And Mike Messina made the comment about his teammates that, you know, the 16 years where he never missed a single game. I mean, what if he missed like 10 games a year where he just sat out? You know, every two weeks or so he sat out a game. That'd be 160 games. That's a whole One season, season. Of, a full season of games that he didn't miss because he played every single day for 16 years. That's a lot of hits. A lot of hits. On the other hand, there are those, and, and I think you said this many times years and years ago, that Cal 
might have had a higher batting average over the years if he had taken a, a day off every every so often. Right. So maybe he would still have the same number of hits, being honest with you, and it went a 300 average. Because I, I just think that, you know, he would have, on a personal level, he would have hit for a higher average had he taken some games off over that 10-year period. Cal's hit tonight, by the way, tied him for 22nd place with Al Kaline, another Baltimorean. Although Kaline, as Will Clark, draws the walk. But two down here in the seventh inning to bring up Charles Johnson. Al Kaline got his hits for the Detroit Tigers, one of the all-time Tiger greats, but Kaline from Baltimore. I don't think the Detroit fans appreciate that. They think, he might think of him as a man from Detroit. They have a statue outside the new stadium, right? Yeah. Al Kaline. Well, Brooks Robinson. I think is considered a Baltimorean and still makes his home in Baltimore years after his retirement from baseball. But he's from Arkansas. So Baltimore's Brooks, he has often said, it's his adopted home. Al Kaline. Detroit is his adopted home. Okay. But he's from Baltimore. You know what? I believe that if memory serves, as we look at that last pitch again from Mulder. Change up. And a good one. 0-2 oh, the count to Charles Johnson. Al Kaline got his 3,000th hit in Baltimore at the old Memorial Stadium. Just foul outside of first. Jeff Kibler, our producer, said he has received confirmation on that. That he did get it in Baltimore. I believe in 1974. 0-2 oh, the count to Charles Johnson, who was old for two in the game. Cal Ripken hit over 300, or has in his career, five times. Not like, I mean, he never hit 300. Cal hit 340 last year. 1991, he hit 323 and won the MVP award. 1983, he hit 318 and won the MVP award. That was the last time the Orioles won the World Series. In fact, the last time they went to the World Series. I don't want to really discuss that. And beat the Philadelphia Phillies. And he's had a lot of older players on their roster that year. <laughs> We're going to the last of the seventh inning. Oakland trailing the Orioles 2-1. to one. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball presented by Gum Out. There's the Oakland Coliseum as seen from the Gum Out aerial cam. We're certainly glad to have them with us here in the Bay Area. We're into the last of the seventh inning, and a new pitcher has come on for Baltimore. Way down there on that mound on the middle of the infield, B.J. Ryan, a 24-year-old left-hander. Facing Frankie Menachino, who has hit a double and scored Oakland's only run tonight. There's B.J. Ryan. He was acquired at the trading deadline last year from Cincinnati in the trade that sent the veteran right-hander Juan Guzman over to the Reds. Menachino drives it into deep center field. I'm all going way, way back and makes the catch! And well, the Orioles continue to come up big defensively. They made several outstanding plays tonight. Well, that was an excellent play because it appeared that the ball was going to be over his head, and that probably would have been a triple because it's hit straightaway center field, and by the time they would have been able to get back to it, it would have been a triple as he hits the wall. Nice catch. Ooh. We expect these kind of catches from Junior Griffey. But nice play there by Rich Amaral. Rich Amaral, who's a guy who plays all over the place. I mean, I remember him as being an infielder. Right. But he obviously is a very fine outfielder as well. Rich Becker, the leadoff man, has uh, been lifted here for Ryan Christensen, a pinch hitter. Christensen pulls one foul and quickly is behind to the count at 0-2. Christensen hitting 281 for the year in 32 at bats no homers three driven in the Oakland bullpen is busy as Ryan misses up and away BJ Ryan's only 24 years old and in six outings so far this year for Mike Hargrove he's only given up one run and six hits in six and a third innings pitch slider low for a ball in the Oakland bullpen it's the left-hander Mike Magnante the right-hander TJ Matthews warming up the open starter Mike uh, Mark Mulder has thrown 103 pitches in seven innings 
And both of these young pitchers have been pretty impressive tonight against clubs that know how to score the run. Well, they both pitch very well. Mulder had the one bad inning, the fourth inning, where he gave up the two runs. He went through the count. Johnson had the one inning in the fifth where he was in a lot of trouble. He was able to get out on a catch by B.J. Serhoff that ended the inning, but replay showed that the ball did bounce, but it was a very difficult call for the umpire. Two and two the count. Two runs would have scored. There were two down when Matt Stairs hit the pop fly in the fifth inning. Strike three called to Ryan Christensen, out number two. Let's go to our colleague, Alvaro Martin. John, last year, the Oakland A's led the majors with 770 walks. That's about almost five walks a game. And that not only led the league, but also was the fifth highest total in Major League history. There's a reason for that. Throughout the system, the organization, they have selectivity awards. If you want to be the batter of the month at any of their levels, it doesn't matter if you hit 400 or, hit or get 10 home runs. You have to have a minimum amount of walks per at-bats to even be eligible for the award. Now, that also impacts these players as they move up in the organization. The more patient you are, the more selective you are, you move up quicker in the organization and you reach the majors. And, of course, that has an impact on their contractual situation as well. So there are incentives here for these people to be patient. Back to the booth. All right, Alvaro, that's uh, very interesting. Well, John, I did not realize that that's the way they sort of gave guys an inspiration to, to be patient. And the reason I think it's interesting, John, is that I go back to a quote that Kenny Lofton made. He says, no one gets credit for stealing bases anymore. It's all the big sluggers. And if you don't get credit for stealing bases, you know you do not get credit for walks. So yeah. I think that's a good thing the A's are doing, showing yeah. the importance of getting on base. Miguel Tejada just hit one about a thousand miles an hour that had Ron Washington, the third base coach, it had him thinking about all of the major moments of his life. His life flashed before his eyes there. Look out, Ron. Incoming. Uh, that wouldn't hurt much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't have felt a thing. <laughs> two and two the count. He told me a story before the game about Ron Washington breaking Cal Ripken's consecutive game inning streak. Yeah. Cal once went about five full seasons without ever missing an inning. Forget about games, never missed an inning for five years. And then Ron Washington was the guy who brought in to end that streak. The Orioles were down 18 to 3 in the eighth inning of the game in Toronto. Blue Jays had set the home run record. They hit 10 home runs in the game. Cal Ripken Sr. was the manager. He told Ron Washington, you go in and replace Cal at short. And the foul tip is held by Charles Johnson. Strike three. Tejada retired for the first time tonight. Impressive inning for Ryan. We're going to the eighth inning. Baltimore coming up, leading two to one. Cal, they know you're meaning Cal Ripken. Here in the Bay Area, you say Cal, you mean the University of California at Berkeley, which we were just looking at there a moment ago. Here's Mike McDante, the new Oakland pitcher. He has thrown ball one to Jesse Garcia, leading it off for the Baltimore Orioles. Two to one, the Orioles are leading. Garcia hitting ninth in the order, takes a knee-high strike, and it is one and one. And what a performance as we check out Garcia's numbers. 0 for 1 tonight with a walk. And what a performance by Mark Mulder in his second Major League start. That's a slider miss. 2 and 1 the count. Ryan Christensen stays in the ball game, plays center field after pinch hitting for Rich Becker in the seventh. I mean, this Baltimore team, Joe, has been in a roll, hitting 3.09 as a team, averaging nearly seven runs a game. And Mark Mulder walked in here and just shut them down. He threw the ball very, very well. Good fastball, good curveball, good slider, and a good change. He's got all the pitches, and he had good control. So I think you're going to be seeing a lot of, of Mark Mulder, and he's going to be successful. And he pitched against two of the best hitting teams in the league to start off his career. He pitched against Cleveland, and now here are the Orioles. Cleveland in Cleveland. Right. And tonight against this hot-hitting Orioles team. The Orioles 11-5 and five coming into the game. Slider to third. Chavez. And 
Giambi had to stretch out to bring it in, but he was able to do it. One away. Garcia retired. And that'll bring up Rich Amaral. Amaral, who is 0 for 3. He's the leadoff man for the Orioles tonight. We were talking, Joe, about the, that you brought up about Ron Washington replacing Cal Ripken. Right. Ending his consecutive innings streak at five years <laughs> of every inning of every game. And when Cal Ripken Sr., then the manager, told him that he was going in, Ron says, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think he said that Rip Sr. put it to us as, do you want to go in and play short for Cal? And Ron's like, uh, do I want to replace Cal after five years? He says, listen, you just go in, grab your glove and go in. I'll handle Cal. <laughs> and that's what Washington did. He just grabbed his glove and just went on out there. Well, he's lucky they were on the road and not in Baltimore. <laughs> Had to be there. It was an 18-3 game. The Orioles were just getting shelled. Ten home runs hit just by the Blue Jays. Still a major league record. The headlines in the Baltimore Washington papers the next day, nothing about that. It was Ripken finally sits. <laughs> misses an inning. From Mascan. Won by Ramon Hernandez. Three and one now to count to Rich Amaral. John, he, he told me a story about, he said he was on the road, of course, when he got his 3,000 hit this year. When he got home, he said there were like 40-something messages on his answering service. And he was going through them, you know, one at a time. Popped up. Foul ground. Hernandez. And that is out number two. Go ahead, Joe. And he said he got to them one from our Rick Sutcliffe. ESPN's own Rick, Rick yeah. Sutcliffe. And Rick Sutcliffe said, you need to change the message on your answering service and say, instead of saying, got your message, get back to you as soon as possible, say, I'll get back to you sometime next year. <laughs> <laughs> he had so many messages and they were just piling up. And he said that Tony Gwynn finally chased him down. Tony Gwynn was sign trying to send him a message of, you know, congratulating him on the, joining the 3000 hit club. And he said it, he got, finally got a fax that chased him all over the country until he got it. There's ball one to Mike Bordick. Cal Ripken, 3,000 hits. Bordick, one for three. His one hit was a double in the fourth inning when the Orioles got all of their hits for the game. They bunched them together. Bordick, Sirhoff, Bell. And then later, Cal Ripken with a clutch two-out RBI single. And that's how they got their two runs against Mark Mulder. One ball, one strike to count. <laughs> they gum out in-game box score up till now. You see those hits have been few and far between, but except in that fourth inning when they got four of them in the span of five batters. Bordick through Ripken. And Ripken's RBI is the one that has the Orioles leading here in the eighth inning, two to one. The big power coming up for the Athletics in the last of this inning. Bordick hits one deep, but there's Christian. Left center. Three up, three down. McDante retires the side in order. Now Giambi, Jaha, and Stairs coming up. The Athletics down by a run. Baseball from Oakland. We've got a tight one. A pitcher's duel. The Orioles two. The Athletics one. But the big power is up now for the Athletics. Jason Giambi taking a strike. He has driven in Oakland's only run with a sacrifice fly. That was back in the fifth inning. He's also popped out and grounded out. Left-hander against left-hander here. Ooh, and he has the big home run rip there. Oh, and two. The Baltimore bullpen is busy. At the same time, the right-handed batting Jaha on deck. And two more lefties, though, after Jaha. Stairs and Green. Mm. Just off the outside. <laughs> Mike Trombley will be the closer tonight for Baltimore. Uh, in the bullpen. They've given Timlin the job, I guess, the last two nights, and he wasn't able to come through. Well, he actually got the save here on Friday night. No swing there on the appeal. Jerry Lane moving in favor of Giambi. Two and two. Timlin ended up getting the save, but... Had to get out of a bases loaded jam Friday. And then was not left in to get out of a, another big jam yesterday. They brought in Buddy Groom to wrap it up. That got to play. This B.J. Ryan, Joe, he looks pretty tough. Well, he's thrown nothing but fastballs. Doesn't look like he's 
thrown a sinker or two, but I haven't seen him throw any breaking balls yet. But he looks like he has great movement on his fastball. Ryan retired three in a row in the seventh, I think two on strikeouts. Foul tip, and Johnson had a drop off his glove. Well, if Jambi gets on base somehow here, he would be only the second man to lead off an inning to reach base. Frank Manichino led off the fifth with a double. He is the only leadoff hitter to have gotten on the whole game. Jason Giambi. Two balls, two strikes to count. Giambi, seven homers, 24 runs batted in for the year. His turn on deck. A right-handed hitter. 3-2 pitch. A little bit high. Ball four. Good patience there by Giambi. Jason Giambi, who says he just loves being on the field with Cal Ripken. Sounds kind of sappy, but it's an honor to be on the same field with him. I mean, he's the ultimate ball player. Goes out there, plays hard every single day. You know, it's somebody that you could pattern your game after to go out there and, you know, guys look to him to be team leader and be out on the field every day, hurt whether, it, you know, he's out there every day. And that's, that's something you need to look to as a player in yourself. Cal Ripken as a role model and a great role model. You look at Alex Rodriguez, Joe. I mean, Cal Ripken was always the guy he idolized. And you look at some of the young stars in the game now and the way they comport themselves and their work ethic. Very Ripken-esque. Jaha with a big cut. Well, Jaha went out of the strike zone there. He took a strike on the first pitch. I think the big pitch in this whole ball game has been the strike three call to Jaha. His last at bat with Tejada running. He took strike three. And Tejada was safe at second base. But I thought if he'd have put the ball in play then, they would have tied the game. Well, he went back with the same pitch. This time Jaha laid off. One ball and two strikes. Stairs. Another lefty power hitter on deck. Then Greed behind him, also lefty. That's why Ryan is in here facing the right-handed batting. Jaha. Giambi at first. Nobody out. Too far in. That was a cut fastball. Fastball, yeah. Two and two. Everything he's thrown so far has been hard stuff. That was a cut fastball. He turned the sinker over, but he's got his riding fastball seems to be his best pitch. Or the pitch that he likes the best. Did it again. Well, Mariano Rivera, great closer of the Yankees, is so tough. Partly because left-handed hitters who are supposed to be able to hit the right-handed better can't handle that, that cutter that he throws. Now he has run out of room with which to maneuver. He cannot afford to walk Jaha. Jaha is the possible go-ahead run. We're in the eighth inning of a one-run game. The Orioles, as we see Sammy Ellis, the pitching coach, on the dugout bench looking on. The Orioles lead by just the one. And he struck him out. He chased that high one. Hard times for John Jaha. Now Matt Stairs. Last time he was up, there were runners at second and third with two down. In the fifth inning, and he has a little pop fly. Well, John, I think the way you can tell is watch the fingers are pointed down. Anytime the fingers are pointed down, you can't catch the ball. Well, if you're acting to the fans, I'm second guess myself. Yeah, I, 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 I think he's short off the ball. It cost us two runs. All right, how would I do? I give with Jerry Lane after that call. And that was his point. It cost us two runs. One strike to count to Matt Stairs. Of course, on the other hand, I thought that Tejada had been thrown out at second base when Jaha struck out, and the inning should have been over before Stairs got out. In the end of right field, not deep enough. Albert Bell, plenty of room. He goes back in behind this Giambi at first base, but he's easily back in. Two down. Ball is not 
carry as well here at the Coliseum. And the end of the sun sets down. Come out in game box score for Oakland. Not much there. Only four hits for the Athletics. Jason Jambi with the only RBI. I mean, this has been a pitcher's night all the way around. Two to one, the Orioles leading the Athletics. The Orioles trying to complete a sweep of this series. Ben Grieve, the hitter. Strike, and it's on one. Good job by Mike Hargrove having Ryan ready for the middle of this order, you know, to be able to face Giambi, Jaha, Stairs, and Ben Greed. A lot of times managers do not get credit for having their bullpens and having things set up so that they can, you know, have things in their favor rather than the percentages go against them. Hargrove has three lefties in the bullpen. One of them, Chuck McElroy, has been very ineffective. The other, Buddy Groom, has been very effective the first two games of this series. But Hargrove wants to give him the night off tonight because he's worked two straight days. So Ryan's his lefty. He wants to give Timlin the night off because Timlin's worked two straight days coming off the disabled list. Actually, three straight days. Before they got to town, there's Timlin. Oh, we, so Trombley is uh, the closer. John, what we saw there with Mike Hargrove, he was moving Cal Ripken to a spot he wanted. Cal was covering the line a little bit more, and uh, Mike Hargrove wanted to move a little bit more towards shortstop. So Ripken is over near the line at third, but not as close to the line as he had been for the left-handed batter. Ooh, that was close. And you see Mike Hargrove yelling. He thought it was a pretty good pitch as well. Now the Orioles' bullpen has not overall been as bad as those numbers would suggest. Well, Ripken, because he had been moved over, gets to that ball and gets the force out at second with Garcia covering. Well, that's when you have to give credit to Mike Hargrove. A little subtle thing that took away a base hit. Ball from Oakland, the Orioles to the Athletics one. That's the view of the Coliseum, courtesy of the Gum Out Aerial Camera. And we're pleased to have them with us again this year. Right of these uh, great aerial portraits. Mike McDante back for his second inning. B.J. Surhoff leads it off. And he takes ball one. Surhoff, a left-handed hitter, but then you get three righties. Bell, Conine, and Ripken. So three right-handed hitters who are all good right-handed hitters. So this may be the only batter McNante faces here in the ninth inning. Ah! Art Howe tries to keep the deficit at just the one run. B.J. Surhoff has driven in one of Baltimore's runs tonight with a single back in the fourth inning when they bunched up all four of their hits for the game. Did he swing? No. Well, they didn't ask the third base umpire, so the home plate umpire was very sure. Two and one. B.J. Surhoff was 25 hits already this year. This is only the 17th game. So we take a look from Mascan. High and foul and out of play off the left field line. His 24 hits through the first 16 games coming into play tonight were the most by an Orioles player after that many games since 1982 when Eddie Murray began the year with 29 hits in 16 games. D.J. Surhoff. to the count. Surhoff now 35 years of age. The Orioles have seven players in the lineup tonight who are 33 years old or older. Out of play again. Two balls, two strikes to Surhoff. They're the, the oldest team on their 25-man roster in the majors. 32.4 years of age is the average age of the 25 men. Next, the New York Mets little below 32 years old. <laughs> that was close. Three and two. McNaughty looks none too happy. Well, he takes a little off of this. It's a change up. And BJ was fooled, but it stayed inside. Three and two. 
down the left field line. That is a foul ball. They came right back this time with a breaking ball, three and two. And DJ stayed on it. Magnante throws a breaking ball. Well, see it's moving away. It's meant to change up, actually, but it moved. The same pitch he threw the pitch before, but that was that one moved like a breaking ball. Three and two. Two to one, the Orioles lead. Jason Giambi takes it to the back himself. One away. We told you that Hargrove had just moved Ripken over here. He's moving him over. He said, move over a little bit. I don't want you as close to the line. Right there. And, he, and this is the play that saved the inning. Kept the A's from moving the tying run to third base. So two veterans working together there. It's very common in a tight ball game like this when you've got a one-run lead to have your corner infielders hugging the foul lines. Ripken was doing that, but Hargrove played a hunch and, and it him over. Paid off beautifully. Magnante out. The A's go to their bullpen, but T.J. Matthews are right-handed. And we'll be right back. Albert Bell coming up. Mulfin, the Orioles 2, the Athletics 1. That's the view of the Coliseum. Courtesy of the Gum Out Aerial Camera. And we're pleased to have them with us again this year. Running these uh, great aerial portraits. Mike McDante back for his second inning. B.J. Surhoff leads it off. And he takes ball one. Surhoff, a left-handed hitter, but then you get three righties. Bell, Conine, and Ripkins. So three right-handed hitters who are all good right-handed hitters. So this may be the only batter McNante faces here in the ninth inning. As Art Howe tries to keep the deficit at just the one run. B.J. Surhoff has driven in one of Baltimore's runs tonight with a single back in the fourth inning when they bunched up all four of their hits for the game. Did he swing? No. Well, they didn't ask the third base umpire, so the home plate umpire was very sure. Two and one. B.J. Surhoff was 25 hits already this year. This is only the 17th game. As we take a look from Mascan. High and foul and out of play off the left field line. His 24 hits through the first 16 games coming into play tonight were the most by an Orioles player after that many games since 1982 when Eddie Murray began the year with 29 hits in 16 games. D.J. Surhoff. Two and two the count. Surhoff now 35 years of age. The Orioles have seven players in the lineup tonight who are 33 years old or older. Out of play again. Two balls, two strikes to Surhoff. They're the, the oldest team on their 25-man roster in the majors. 32.4 years of age is the average age of the 25 men. Next, the New York Mets. A little below 32 years old. <coughs> that was close. Three and two. McNaughty looks none too happy. Well, he takes a little off of this. It's a changeup. And BJ was fooled, but it stayed inside. Three and two. Down the left field line, that is a foul ball. They came right back this time with a breaking ball, three and two. And DJ stayed on it. McNaughty throws a breaking ball. Well, see it's moving away. It's meant to change up, actually, but it moved. The same pitch he threw the pitch before, but that, was, that one moved like a breaking ball. Three and two. Two to one, the Orioles lead. Jason Giambi takes it to the back and shot. One away. We told you that Hargrove had just moved Ripken over here. He's moving him over. He said, move over a little bit. I don't want you as close to the line. Right there. And, he, and this is the play that saved the inning. Kept the A's from moving the tying run to third base. So... Two veterans working together 
is very common in a tight ball game like this when you've got a one run lead to have your corner infielders hugging the foul lines. Ripken was doing that, but Hargrove played a hunch and, moved and it him over. paid off beautifully. Magnante out, the A's go to their bullpen, but T.J. Matthews a right-handed, and we'll be right back. Albert Bell coming up. ESPN Studios, I'm Reese Davis. We hope you're enjoying our encore presentation of Major League Baseball, but due to time constraints, we are going to move ahead to further action in our coverage. Now let's get you back out to the ballpark. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, last of the ninth inning. The Orioles three outs away from a sweep here over the Athletics. And there is Mike Trombley, formerly with the Minnesota Twins, now trying to get the save here tonight for the Orioles. And he'll face the last third of the Athletics batting order in a two-to-one ball game. Now, Baltimore did win the first two games of this series, but the Athletics did not go quietly in the ninth inning in either one of those games. They ended up with the pace loaded two days in a row before losing by two runs on Friday and one run yesterday. So here is Ramon Hernandez. Hernandez, one for three tonight, but only three for 28 against right-handed pitching for the year. Well, it appears to me, John, that the wind is blowing out toward right and right center. And maybe a little difficult to hit one out in left field at this point. And here's Trombley. Third ball low and outside. Staying away from Ramon Hernandez, who does have some power. And you see how the flags are blowing through that opening out there in left field. Strike corner on the outside. Mike Trombley, by the way, when he saw Cal Ripken get his 3,000 hit, eight nights ago in Minnesota, it was the fourth time that he had seen somebody get their 3,000 hit. He was Paul Molitor's teammate when Molly did it in 1996 in Kansas City. And he was also Dave Winfield's teammate when he did it for the Twins. And Trombley gave up Eddie Murray's 3,000 hit. So I, I'm, I'm sure he saw that one. Field. Way, way back there, this ball game is tied up. Ramon Hernandez, adios, pelota. Well, I guess you can hit it out of here with a hanging curveball. He made two good pitches with fastball to win and came back with a curveball. Breaking ball right in the middle of the plate. And when Hernandez hit it, there was no doubt about it. Now here is Eric Chavez. And he is suddenly the possible winning run. Strike call to the outside. Well, this is the way the A's played last year. When they needed home runs, they were able to come up with them. Because they do have power all through the lineup. In the dirt. One ball, one strike. Chavez has hit three homers this year. He's got 14 batted in. He's got terrific power. The young Ramon Hernandez is going deep. 23 years old. Here's the 22-year-old Chavez. Change up, up and away. Two and one. And the pinch hitter has come out on deck. Another left-handed hitter. Here's Jeremy Giambi. Two and one the count to Chavez. Oh, he had the big rip. Two and two the count. Don't forget now, when the ball game's over, stay tuned for Sports Center. Home run history made today at the Sky Dome in Toronto by the Yankees. NBA playoffs have begun in a conversation with Vince Carter. And the crowd here at the Coliseum on its feet, offering encouragement. Oh, man. 
Well, he's not getting cheated up there. Now, that pitch looked pretty bad, didn't it? Well, but three balls, two strikes, you've got to challenge him. You don't want to walk him and then have him bunt the winning run over to second base. And it is, but it's got a little movement on it. And that's what saved it. Three and two to Chavez. Nobody out. A run already in for the Athletics. And the Hernandez homer. The Orioles blow the save. That is the big question mark, despite their excellent early season record. The bullpen. Is it going to be able to hold up its end? Changed up. And Chavez just did get a piece of it. The Good Orioles have pitches there. Sorry, Joe. The Orioles have already blown five save opportunities in the early part of this season. There's Mike Timlin, who had a torn stomach muscle in spring training to put him under the table this when the season began. He's just gotten back. And it is. He misses with the split-fingered pitch. Chavez gets the, the walk. Let's take a look at this. Here's the breaking ball that hangs in the middle of the plate. And Hernandez drives it out of here. There wasn't any doubt about that one. You can see B.J. Serhoff just turns and look. That's way out of here. And you can see Art Howell. He's happy. Well, now the, the walk is Hernandez celebrated the home run. The walk has changed things a little bit here. Well, that's right. I mean, that's why I said if you walk him, he's going to bunt him over. That's why I thought he had to challenge him with a fastball. So it's Menachino left up there, not Jeremy Giambi. The bunt, well placed. And Conine to Garcia covering. And the possible winning run has been moved into scoring position. Now he had the guys charging hard on both corners, Joe. And he put it right between the pitcher and first baseman. Well, the pitch is high. Trombley did what he's supposed to do. If a guy's bunting, you try to throw the ball up in the strike zone, maybe you'll get him to pop it up. But a good job there by Menachino to get it down. And you can see the difference here. You, if you're Art Howe, you're not going to send Giambi up now because if you send him up there, they'll probably, they would walk him. So he's going to go ahead and let Ryan Christensen hit. Christensen entered the game as a pinch hitter for Becker in the seventh inning. And if you're Art Howe, you want to save Giambi in case this goes extra innings, then you need a pinch hitter in a clutch situation. The Orioles are 11 and 5 this year, but they have had several of those games that they lost were lost in the bullpen late in the game. Curveball in there for a strike. I mean, the Orioles could well be 14 and 2. They had three games consecutively in Kansas City where the Royals walked off the field winning a ball game in their last at bats. And then they, they lost one in the eighth inning in Minnesota that they had led nine to four. The Twins got six runs to beat them. Oh, another big curveball. Quickly, he's ahead 0-2. All right, just throwing two great curveballs like that. Now what? Well, depending on whether you want to waste one, you you know, you throw a high fastball, try to get him to chase it or waste it. How about another curveball in the dirt this time? Well, I don't think you want to throw it in the dirt and risk a wild pitch. That's Chavez over at second. So you go right after him. That was a pretty good curveball down and away. That's the danger. That's the problem you have 0 2 with a runner in scoring position. You don't want to bounce the ball because you may get away. Now, you had Charles Johnson back there. Yeah, but when that ball hits with a good spinning curveball, it may go any place, and you may not be able to block it if you're Charles Johnson. And that's a good point. Too risky. Yeah. To that curve in the game. Oh, and two to count. Tries to go inside. Ends up in the dirt. And Charles Johnson, sure enough, Keeps the ball in front of him and keeps Chavez at second base. And percentages say that Charles Johnson would block the ball, but it only takes one time for it to get away. This is a fastball, a, a little sinking fastball he throws inside and just bounces. May have been a changeup he held on to too long, but it wasn't the curveball. Even that one almost got by Johnson. Struck him out. Beautiful pitch right there. I mean, that is what you wanted 0-2. That was like a perfect pitch. Curveball knee high. 
and biting toward the outside corner. See Johnson's target? Watch where this ball goes. Diving right out there. That's a great pitch. The only way you can hit this pitch is if you're committed to going the other way with it. And he did. So now it is Miguel Tejada. A base hit for the outfield would most likely win the game for the Athletics. Right now, Trombley is just trying to save the tie to send it to extra innings. Third ball for a strike. Ramon Hernandez led off the inning with a home run, his second of the year. The only home run of the game. Two to two, last of the ninth. Tejada has been on base three times. And the split finger pitch blowing outside. One ball, one strike. Tejada's reached on an error. He's walked, he's singled, and he has struck out. And Tejada's a guy that will go the other way. So he, went, he could take that breaking ball to right center field. Here's Chavez at second. Ready to run on the crack of the bat with two down. Pops it up. Conine. And we are going extra innings. On to the 10th inning now. Will Clark will be coming up. It is 2-2 two two in Oakland. Sunday night baseball from Oakland. It is 2-2 two two at the top of the 10th inning. I want to remind you that next Sunday at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on ESPN2, check out baseball today. Live reports from Sunday's biggest games. And also next Sunday at noon Eastern, a special look at the Expo's special superstar, Vladimir Guerrero. Baseball today on ESPN2, Sundays at noon. Bad Vlad and a couple more hits again today for Liz Expo's. Here's Will Clark against T.J. Matthews. Time was when Will Clark would have been figured as a big home run threat in a spot like this, Joe. But he has not been hitting many home runs. Yeah, but he's always capable of. Left field, but there's three. One away. Clark 0 for 3. Vladimir Guerrero today was two for three against Milwaukee. The Expos have been playing real well. They won the ball game. Well, Felipe Alou, Felipe Alou said that he thought this team could be one of the best teams he's had in a long time. Strike one to Charles Johnson. They got Vladimir Guerrero. He's hitting 439 for the year, and he's got 25 RBIs now. Got two more today. Well, Johnson tried to put the Orioles back ahead with one swing. Oh, and two to count. He's capable. He's got a lot of power. Two to two in the top of the tenth. But a pitcher's night at the Coliseum is really getting cool here now. The wind is whipping around inside this ballpark. That's a foul out of play off to the right. Due up next is uh, Garcia, the second baseman, but Delino De Shields has come out on deck. He's the veteran. Yeah, Delino didn't start tonight because the left-handed Mark Mulder started. So they were giving him some time off. Johnson 0 for 3 in the game. No balls, two strikes to count. Chavez hugging the line at third for Oakland. Oh, nice pitch. Strike three call. Well, the reason we are here in the 10th inning is because Hernandez hit a home run to tie it. There he is, the catcher. Take a look at this. You'll see that he gets it right out in front. Right there, a beautiful swing. Just underneath, just slide up a cut. Gets enough of it to drive it out of the ballpark. Now Delano De Shields. Comes up as a pinch hitter for Garcia. First ball swinging, and Aquino, and just like that, the inning is over. Now the Athletics have their top sluggers coming up. After a seven-pitch inning for T.J. Matthews, it'll be Giambi, Jaha, and Matt Stairs. Two to two in Oakland. Now to the last of the tenth inning. 
from Oakland, John Miller and Joe Morgan with you. And there is Tim Worrell on the pitch now for the Athletics. In relief, uh, Trombley. So Trombley unable to get the save. And uh, Tim Worrell on for the Orioles now. And the Worrell will be back by Delano DeShields, who stays in the ball game to play second base. Worrell, Joy, looking at his numbers, they were not very strong, but six in the third innings and three home runs given up. He kind of jumped out at him. Yeah, and then he's going through the middle of this order. Jason Jambi, Jaha, and Stairs. They can add one more to it. I mean, all three of these guys hit over 30 home runs last year. In fact, the three of them combined for 106 home runs last year. So Giambi will lead it off against Worrell. And the one thing about the A's, John, they do go for it late in the ball game. So it won't be surprising to see him swing for no. the, the big fly here. No. Jason Giambi. Over at first base, Jeff Conine back near the outfield grass and hugging the foul line. The outfield deep and straight away. Morrell working from the stretch. Fastball at the knees. That one, I don't know, seemed to surprise Giambi. 0-1. Well, it had movement in. It would look like a cutter rather than just a straight fastball. Oh, man, that was up, and he had the big rip. There's Jeremy Giambi. He's come out on deck to apparently act as a pinch hitter for Jaha. Jaha, who has not had a hit yet this year against a right-handed pitcher. Two strikes to Jason Giambi. Tim Worrell. Giambi backs away. Tim Worrell's brother, Todd Worrell, used to be an outstanding closer in the big leagues for a long time. Burns him off the outside. Well, if he put that one into the strike zone, Jason would be going back to the dugout. Well, <laughs> he was trying to do exactly what he did. Start it off the plate and just get the back door. Just get it over the head. One and two. And he tantalized him with a fastball up out of the strike zone. Jason Giambi walked over 100 times last year. He would not offer. And he had good patience against B.J. Ryan, his last at bat to get on by a walk. Curveball. Delano the shield grabs it on the hop. And Giambi is retired. One away. Hit it hard, but right to Delano. That's pretty good curveball there. He was down well down and Giambi went down to get it. No he did well to hit it. it. Yeah, he well hit it as hard as he watch, did. Watch where it ends up. This pitch is almost going to bounce. Look at that. Good swing, but he can't get, you can't get underneath that curveball right there. So pretty good job of pitching by Tim Morrell to a very dangerous bat. Jason Giambi, one away, and now Jeremy G Giambi. Jeremy acquired from the Kansas City Royals this spring. He has not yet gotten it going with the bat. Strike call to the outside. He is not the, the big home run threat of his brother. But he hit 285 last year for Kansas City. Two to two, last of the 10th inning. Matt Stairs is on deck. up there one ball one strike I think the reason they're pinch hitting him for Jaha is because if Jaha was to get on base they're gonna have to pinch run for him anyway if he's the winning run pop foul and out of play off to the left one ball and two strikes Center will follow the ball game, so stay tuned for that. All of the highlights from all of the games around baseball today. 
Center. Everything else that happened in the world of sports on Sports Center. He's hanging tough in there against Worrell. One ball and two strikes. Jeremy Giambi was acquired from Kansas City right about the time pitchers and catchers reported this spring, February the 18th. To give up a young pitcher, Brett Laxton, to get Jeremy. To unite the Giambi brothers. One ball and two strikes. Her ball, back to the screen. Jeremy trying to do what Jason could not against Warrell. Let's get something going here for the Athletics. Two to two, Oakland tying the game in the ninth on the Ramon Hernandez home run. The hot-hitting Orioles shut down by the young Mark Mulder. And then the Oakland bullpen since then. The Orioles have not scored since the fourth inning. Two and two. Oakland got one in the fifth and then the tying run in the ninth. Mike Hargrove was hoping to sneak out of here with a sweep, but he may get the sweep, but he won't be able to sneak out now. Yep. <laughs> Struck him out. So Worrell has retired the whole Giambi family here in the center. <laughs> Coming up, NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, Eastern Conference quarterfinals tomorrow, 7 Eastern on ESPN. It's game six. The Leafs and the Senators. Toronto leads that series three games to two. Looking to wrap it up, ESPN and ABC are the exclusive networks for all Stanley Cup playoff action. Two down, here is Matt Stairs. Ooh. The big cut, 88 miles an hour on the uh, backtrack. That was a pretty good pitch for Stairs to hit out, too. Breaking ball moving in, down a little bit so he could get underneath it. Got a little uppercut in his swing anyway. Too low for the sinker. One ball, one strike. Stairs is 0 for 4 tonight. Number 12. Matt Stairs. The big green machine. Stairs, Giambi, Grieve, Chavez, and Tejada. They all had 20 homers or more last year for the Athletics. 2 and 1 now to Matt Stairs. And this is a, a guy you don't want to fool around with here, but there's another tough lefty on deck, Ben Grieve. Good pitch. Delano the Shields. Three up and three down. So, the batting slump continues for the Athletics. Top of the order, Amaral, Bordick, and Serhoff coming up two to two. Two to two, the Orioles and the Athletics. We go to the 11th inning here in Oakland. John Miller with Joe Morgan. And let's go to our partner, Alvaro Martin. Thanks, John. Well, Brian Graham is the seventh coach for the Baltimore Orioles, but only six can dress during the game. So he's the defensive and offensive coordinator. It's the position that you're more likely to see in football, but rarely in baseball. During the game, he will actually work with the team, setting up the situational offense and defense. He will also chart uh, tendencies, both the Orioles and the opponents, and work with Mike Hargrove. He's been working with Hargrove since 1987. But then during the game, he changes into regular clothing and moves upstairs to the booth. All right, well, that's interesting as Brady Anderson, as a pinch hitter for Amaral, lines out to Matt Stairs in right field on the first pitch that he sees here in the 11th from T.J. Matthews. John, a lot of people believe you can see more up here defensively, you know, the alignment than you can on the field. You can see up here exactly how far off center field the center fielder is playing and move him over a couple of steps more. It's difficult to do that from on the bench because you're looking at ground level and you can't really tell where the gaps are. So sometimes the defensive coordinator could come in handy. A lot of people use guys to help them move the runners or the, uh, defensive players around. There's ball one to Mike Bordick. Bordick is one for four. I remember at various times the, the Yankees, the Dodgers, they had their, their eye in the sky, they used to call them. 2-0 now to Mike Bordick. The Athletics bullpen is busy as T.J. Matthews works here in the 11th. Back to the screen. Two balls and a strike to Bordick. B.J. Sir off on deck. Jason Isringhausen, a right-hander, warming up in the Oakland bullpen. It's their closer ordinarily. 
But when you're a home team in a tie ball game in extra innings, there's not going to be a save opportunity. Two and one the count. Fastball outside. Three and one to board it. You've got Sirhoff next. A very dangerous hitter. And behind him, you've got Albert Bell. So a big pitch or two here to make for Mike Bordick, uh, for, against Mike Bordick for T.J. Matthews. Base hit. Second hit of the game for Bordick. You know, Bordick with 24 RBIs at the start of this day. After 16 games, Joe, in the last 25 years, only two players left field have had more RBIs after 16 games than that. That was Manny Ramirez and Ron Say. Well, he gets a fastball, 3-1 pitch fastball, and he pulls it in the hole. The good thing here, if you're the Orioles, B.J. Serhoff can use the bat well. I mean, he can use all fields. Good situation. You can put a hit and run on. You can do something here if you want to with B.J. Serhoff at bat. And the Orioles have been very aggressive on the base pass so far this year. Not always successfully, but they've stolen 16 bases through the first 16 games of the year. They've also been thrown out 10 times. But Hargrove obviously does not want them to be just a, a one base at a time kind of a ball club. Sir Hoff has driven in a run tonight with a single. Matthews just misses on the outside, and that will send uh, Ramon Hernandez, the catcher, out to the mound to talk to Matthews. Well, the Athletics in the American League West. Seven wins and 11 losses. Last place in the division at the start of the day. The Seattle Mariners atop the division. And the Mariners won again today. Beating the Kansas City Royals. The Mariners are 11 and 6. But they prefer not to get too far behind the first place teams. That's a base hit in the center field. And Bordick is going to go to third. Christensen will have to throw back to second base. And Albert Bell is coming up in a tie ball game with runners at first and third and just one out. Good hitting by B.J. Serhoff, but again, he gets the ball down. He lines it in right center field. Perfect spot to allow Bordick to be able to go around the third base. Sinker down, and we talked about how hitters are hitting that low pitch. That was a great pitch there from... Look at, I mean, look at the pitch down and away. He finds the gap in right center field. And Bordick around the third base easily. And there's the call to the bullpen for Isringhausen. So now Isringhausen, Oakland's closer, comes out to try and save the tie. Albert Bell will be coming up. It's 2-2. Two to two. We'll be right back. Sunday night baseball in extra innings. Top of the 11th inning. And there's Jason Isringhausen with runners at first and third in the, the game, perhaps on the line right here with Albert Bell coming up. Isringhausen with three saves. And John, they say he's throwing the ball very well, using all four of his pitches. He inherits two base runners. Mike Bordick, the possible go-ahead run at third base. B.J. Serhoff over at first. Giambi will play on the bag with him. And Albert Bell at the plate. Albert Bell. One for four in this game. Slider outside and low ball one. Albert Bell has averaged 132 RBIs a year for the last five years. That's the most RBIs in a five-year period since a guy by the name of Joe DiMaggio. Had 691 RBIs in a five-year period back in the late 30s and early 40s. One and one. Albert saw that ball was up, so he went after it, but the ball just kept biting and moving away from him. Two men on, one man out. Slider low and outside. Two and one. This is the first time the Orioles have had a man in scoring position since the fourth inning. They were able to bunch up four hits and get two runs in the fourth. 
Dell had one of those hits. They had had only one hit since the fourth inning until now. This could be two. There's one. And a key to the first. Two. Double play. The side is retired. Tejada to Menachino to Giambi. He stuck with that slider and got what he wanted. The Orioles do not take advantage of a great opportunity. Two to two. Ben Grieve coming up. Then Hernandez and Chavez, the young players. The Oakland Coliseum, now called the Network Associates Coliseum. And we're working overtime here tonight. Brady Addison stays in the ball game for the Orioles to play center field. After he pitched it for Rich Amaral. And uh, Brady, who has been a, a real favorite of Orioles fans since he came to them. Actually, for a long while, Brady did not hit a whole lot. But then it was Johnny Oates, the current Texas manager, who told Brady in spring training, 1992, he says, listen, I'm going to give you the chance to win this job. Show me that you deserve it. And Brady showed him and had a great year, and he's been there ever since. Originally acquired from the Boston Red Sox, along with Kurt Schilling by the Orioles in a deal that sent Mike Boddicker to Boston in a pennant race. Strike one from Tim Worrell to Ben Green. Worrell, who was very sharp in the tenth inning, he was just outstanding against the big Oakland sluggers. Ben Green bounces it foul. Ben Green's got a lot of power. He's the uh, rookie of the year in the American League. Two years ago, he's only 23 years of, of age. He had 28 home runs last year. That was after a very slow start, John. He picked it up, second half. It's 17 of those homers after the All-Star break. Sports Center follows the ball game. Stay tuned. Everything that happened in baseball and everywhere in sports coming up on Sports Center. Morrell tries to pick up the outside with that slider and misses. Two and two to the dangerous Ben Reed. He's got one of those sweet swings that the scouts are always looking for. Right center field. Base hit. Brady Anderson hustling over and it's kicked by him. He loses his footing. He's going to have to chase it. Grieve heading for third. And he's going to make it there easily. It looked like a single with Anderson over there. I don't know that it hydroplaned across the grass or what, but it's... It sure fooled Brady Anderson. Well, I'll tell you what it did. It was hit so hard. I mean, that ball, this ball is smoked in the right center field. I mean, this is a line shot, and you see it skip past him, and then he slipped after it skipped past him. He's going over trying to cut it off. No way he could cut that ball off. It just hit too hard. And then all of a sudden, he slipped down, and the ball went to center field instead of right center. If it bounced to right center, Bell would have been there. Well, that's Green's first triple since his rookie of the year season. So now, R Ramon Hernandez, who homered in the ninth inning, and sent this game next inning, is going to be walked intentionally. And they might do the same with the next hitter, Eric Chavez. Well, I think you have to. You have to walk the bases loaded to give yourself a chance to force the runner at the plate. And one thing that happened is they used Jeremy G Giambi to pinch hit for Jaha. And I thought he would have saved him for this moment. Since they were going that training, but he decided to use him last inning, so he doesn't have him on the bench anymore. And his heart grows, signaling for the intentional walk also to Chavez to load the bases. Why, why load the bases, Joe? Well, because you have a force out at the plate. And you know exactly where you're going all the time. So it takes a little heat off the infield. Yeah, the infielders do not have to make a decision. They know exactly where they're going. They're going home. And then you're, you're going to play the infield in. You try to go home to first for a double play instead of playing back and trying to 
get out of it. You can't play back in this situation because of double play within the ball game. And they don't have to make a perfect throw and worry about a guy sliding under a tag or anything like that. It's, it's a force out. out. A force out is always easier to make than a tag play, and that's why you always want the bases loaded if the winning run is at third base. Although we've seen a lot of managers do a lot of different things in that you may have a guy that's strikeout prone and you try him first. You try to strike him out. But the infield will be in as Olmedo signs will come up. He's a right-handed hitter. He will pinch it for Menachino, but he's also got a lot of power. And he's having a fine year. Hitting 326. The Orioles will also have to bring the outfield in. And if the outfielder cannot catch a fly ball and still throw out Grieve at the plate, then it doesn't matter if they catch it or not. So they're going to be in a position where they can still... Well, you have to be in a position where you can also catch a line drive, you know. And you can see everyone then, B.J. Thurhoff in left field, not in quite as shallow as everyone else. So here's Olmedo saying that Green, the runner at third, does not have a whole lot of speed. S-A-E-N-Z, signs. One ball and no strikes. There is nobody out in the 11th inning. The bases are loaded. A freakish triple by Ben Green prompted all of this. And if yes. you're signs, you have to say to yourself, I get a pitch that I can drive and get to the outfield. And now that he missed with the first pitch, you narrow your strike zone. Needs a strike. That should be plenty deep enough. Anderson's still going back, and this one is over. Yeah. Olmedo signs launches one to the deepest part of the ballpark to end the game. And the Oakland Athletics, as Greaves scores, have averted a sweep at the hand of the Orioles. Oakland wins it three to two. And some strong work out of that Oakland bullpen from Magnante, Matthews, and Isringhausen. And for the Orioles, the bullpen continues to cause a few problems. Well, the pitch is up. It's a fastball up. Even though it's off the plate, he knows he can get it in the air. And that's good hitting. So it becomes a single and an RBI, even though it bounces well over Grady, Brady Anderson's head. As soon as the ball goes in the air, they know the game is over. So that's it. The Oakland Athletics, the team that is expected to contend in the American League West, gets up off the mat in the ninth inning, and they win the ball game in 11, 3-2. That's the final from the Coliseum. Next week, we hope you'll join us. We'll be down in San Diego. The Atlanta Braves take on the San Diego Padres. Chipper Jones up against Tony Gwynn and the Padres. We hope you'll join us then at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Sports Center is next. For Joe Morgan, Alvaro Martin, this is John Miller. Good night from Oakland. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Part of the Go Network. Go.